here we are live and live all right um so today's a little different um that's why i'm wearing my hat so if you scroll through your feed and you see me in a hat that means we're not talking I guess about I should have a hat today. well no it's just for me because we're not doing real estate and finance today even though that's what it says in the very beginning i don't know maybe if you have any real estate questions you can ask kevin but other than that Happy that's to help. that's not my intent to discuss today so um today uh i want to talk about one of my uh personal passions which is uh youth sports and youth athletics and um this is something I had a conversation with somebody not too long ago about and really wanted to bring Kevin in here because um, if there's an expert here in Mansfield about this stuff, uh, he's definitely somebody that I would put into that category. I've known Kevin for a little while now, but uh, for anybody that doesn't know, this is Kevin Lewis. Um, he is a um, currently the reason I'm having him in today is because he's the president of MYBA, which is a Mansfield Youth Baseball Association here in Mansfield where I live. Um, he also does many other things, but, um, and we'll touch on a few of those, but his current business actually is, uh, he does fundraisers, uh, with schools and whatnot. We'll get into that because, um, I think it's a, it's a really good, um, uh, move from what he's been doing with the league for so many years into something, you know, that he, he now has as a business. And then, um, he also spent 15 years as a high level executive for Taco Bueno and, uh, a lot of management and uh, business development skills that he kind of picked up there uh, definitely made the league that I participated in. My my kids played in it. I served on the board for a number of years. Um, definitely made it something that I was proud to be a part of and um, wanted to chat with Kevin a little bit because, you know, whenever you're uh, whenever you're in charge of anything, uh, whether wh whatever that may be, the more people that you have involved in it, the uh, more opportunity there <laughs> there is to maybe you know not be everybody's favorite person all the time and for the most part that's not the problem for Kevin if anybody re really knows him but you know it's the uh, the complaining from the cheap seats mentality sometimes that people get into so um, so I think you know if you get to know people and where their heart is on what they're doing I think it really um, resonates and you start to understand you know really what people's motivations are and I've had that experience dealing with all kinds of people from all walks of life especially with the youth sports stuff so that's really what we're going to chat about today. Uh, but I kind of want to start with um, Kevin. I, I want to, you grew up in DFW, right? Correct. Okay. So tell me a little bit about where you went to high school, you know, family, kind of how you got to what you're doing today. Yeah. So, I mean, we're rooted in the DFW area. I was born in Fort Worth mm -hmm. and uh, where'd you go to high school? I uh, went to Eastern Hills. Okay. Um, different experience than probably it is now, but um Grew up in Burleson. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really where I, I spent my childhood and played baseball. Uh, most of my baseball career was in Burleson. And uh, when I was in middle school, we moved to Fort Worth. Okay. And then I uh, kind of finished out there. And so, you know, I come from a big family, uh, extended family, very large extended family. My mom's dad had 23 brothers and sisters. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Oh, wow. He wore the first wife out and uh, <laughs> she passed away. That's after funny. after 12 kids i think the first one had 12 and the second one had 12. there were two sets of twins this I is believe. your grandfather my grandfather wow my grandfather's dad okay 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 so, so a couple generations he came from, yeah yeah right. so my mom's grandfather and uh and then my dad's side of the family is all kind of local and anywhere from granbury across yeah. dfw so we have we have a lot of family in the area and other than really going off to college in abilene uh, I've always been in the DFW area, mainly in Tarrant County. I know uh, I found out randomly. So um, somebody that I work with in the area, she, title office, uh, Tiffany Williams. Um, yeah, you no probably idea. know Tiffany, you know, Sherry Lamont, uh -huh. uh, Sherry, uh, Sherry Lamont uh, Fisher. Yep. Uh, that's my cousin. Yeah. Sherry is. Uh, it's funny. I saw yesterday on Facebook, somebody posted some question for a realtor and I commented in there. I don't think there's any realtors in this group because <laughs> I think 90% of everybody on the Facebook Mansfield talk group is somehow related in, in real estate yes you know either it's the same way you are or, or an actual realtor but yeah so yeah. you have a you have a big family i do and they're spread out all over the place they're yes. all over the place and you have uh is it just one son is that correct i have one son zach yeah uh he recently graduated college in aerospace engineering wow. he's known since he was like eight years old that he's wanted to do that and uh <clears throat> so he works for lockheed now uh, has a great job with them he's a good guy yeah good kid yeah uh, he he made it, I, I raised him kind of a single dad and he spent most of his time with me and, you know, running as many restaurants as I did and running yeah. MYBA, yeah. um, took up a lot of my time, but he, he definitely made things easy on me. The kid never really got in trouble ever, yeah. like ever. And, and to this day, uh, I'm not aware of the kid ever lying in his life. 
he he cannot not tell the truth to save his life. See, every, he has no matter what it is. Just fell over like. Oh, Be okay. careful what you ask him because he's going to tell you the truth if he answers you because he will not lie. And there was lots of he he actually made me less of a white liar mm -hmm. because there's lots of times when he's growing up he'd say, "Well, that's not true." <laughs> You're right. It's right. not. You know why? Why did I even lie? Like, because right. you make you lie about the dumbest stuff. Yeah. Like somebody says, uh, you know, hey, didn't I see you in the grocery store the other day? That wasn't me. Yeah, like, no, no, Dad, it was. Yeah, you, you were we there. Were we there. were right we there. Were I saw you yesterday, yeah. and I saw him. Yeah. yeah, it's always an exaggeration. It's like, oh, you know, I, I, uh, I was working out again. I was been at the gym for like the last five days. Like he went one day yeah. last week. It's like, you well, can't okay. really count sitting in the parking lot, Dad. You were picking me up, <laughs> right? Which right. he's really into working out now. Yeah, you know, he was a small guy growing up. Uh, small super fast but small and uh about i don't know four or five years ago he started getting into working out and he's been very disciplined about it and uh he he transformed his body big time he's he's really in good shape that's great he, he didn't get that part from me no. <laughs> uh, obviously but uh, so was your um I, I would assume that you, when your son was growing up, that was the reason you got into coaching and getting into baseball and kind yeah. of where you led to NYBA. Is that right? You know, my dad coached me and my brothers, um, you know, when we were little and, mm -hmm. you know, before I ever had a, a, a child, I thought, you know, that's definitely what I want to do. So definitely when he became three, four years old and started playing sports, uh, I coached him from the get go. In fact, his very first experience, <clears throat> I'd lived out in uh, the Plano area for a short amount of time. And then we were moving back this way. In fact, I was building my house here in Plano and it wasn't quite ready in my house in the Plano area. So, so we moved in with my parents for about six months up mm -hmm. in South Arlington and he was old enough to start playing a sport. And so I, I was never a fan of soccer growing up. It's just, it's not my thing. It's still not my thing. It's just not exciting to me, but I wanted him to, I didn't want to pigeonhole him to yeah, baseball. I want to all figure out what he wants to do, just yeah. like every parent does. Absolutely. Most do. So I signed him up for soccer with the YMCA in Arlington. Okay. And um, I'll never forget on a Friday night, I got a phone call and they said, Mr. Lewis, I said, yeah. And they said, well, this, this is the YMCA. They said, we got some good news and we got some bad news. And I said, okay. What's the good news? And they said, well, Zach's on the orange crush. Okay. I'll never forget the orange crush. I said, Awesome what's the bad news? And they said, we have no coach. <laughs> and I said, okay. And they said, it gets worse. And I said, okay. They said, first game's tomorrow. So I'm not even joking. Yes. And I, they said, can you coach? And I said, well, can I coach? Yes. Can I coach soccer? Give me the rule book, send it to me now. Right. And I guess I could coach anything if I, if I know this is before I said, YouTube, by the way, too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah there was no, <laughs> no Googling YouTube. No. So they sent, they, they sent me a, a rule book or I got my hands on somehow and, and learned just enough to put kids out there and say, go put the ball down there. Um, I didn't know anything about positions forwards and all that. All I knew was goalie. Yeah. You know, every kid knows goalie. So anyway, that's how it started. Then I signed him up for baseball with the Y while we were there also for that summer, I think. And started and, and was coaching there. And this is kind of how I got into MYBA is we were playing with the Y. And uh, I think the Y sports programs serve a purpose, but you can quickly outgrow the YMCA's programs. Yes. And uh, we did very quickly. And I remember the first summer we were playing, there was a team out of Mansfield that had come down there to play because uh, MYBA didn't play summer ball at all. Right. And so they'd come down and play this little summer league at YMCA and go back. And they uh, just destroyed everybody, basically. Well, they were destroyed. Uh, supposedly, we're winning the leagues in Mansfield. Yeah. Uh, and they came down to YMCA and, of course, were destroying teams. But we beat them. Oh, okay. My little YMCA team okay. beat them. And so the coach came to me afterwards and said, hey, let's merge teams. <laughs> and, and I go he play. Wants, he but wants to join forces. You don't want to be in, in the YMCA right. any longer. Come join forces with us. Let's take your top three or four, and I'll keep my top six or whatever. They were just going into coach pitch. I think at the time we played coach pitch at the Y I believe. And then we were, they were just starting coach pitch at NYB. So anyway, we did that. We merged with them because I was moving to Mansell anyway. And I could tell we, we, it, were, we, we were not last very long in the way. Yeah. It's, yeah. That's not where we need to be. And yeah. so we played with them for a season or two. And then I, it's just very hard. It's a far, hard for me to be a follower. I, it's just something in me I got to lead, and it was just so hard well, for I me to what, be an assistant coach. I think what it is, because I, I have a little bit of that as well, is that when you get into a situation and you see improvement that could happen in that situation, and you know that you have 
you're like, well, I could, you know, I could, we could, they should be doing this and they should be doing this. And it, it, whether it be a team or a league or what, it doesn't matter what's at work, whatever you have a tendency. Yeah, that's definitely hard for any assistant coach, I think to sit on. But for me, I just, I don't know. It's, it's uncomfortable, uncomfortable for me not to be in charge. Right. And a lot of people are just the opposite. Yeah. Leadership scares them, makes them uncomfortable. Sure. And it doesn't me. Like right. I, I have always wanted, I remember there's a friend of mine, Jason, I don't know if he'll end up seeing this or not, but I ran into him after many years from when we were kids. And one of the first thing he said is one thing I remember about you, you were always the leader. We were five years old. He said, no matter what we were doing, everybody did whatever Kevin did. Yeah. And it wasn't that I had a bossy mentality or anything like that. I just, there's something about me. I just gravitate towards leadership and it was hard for me to do that. Now we, it was a good team we were playing with that yeah. we came up here and played with. It wasn't so much that I saw things I wanted to do different. I just needed to be, and Charles, I wanted to be the head coach. And so after, I think, two seasons, um, I, I went and moved on, started my own team. And then I think by the second season, I had two teams. And it wasn't long before. After that, I had three teams. And uh, that's how I got to MYBA. Yeah. Um, as far as getting onto the board, um, uh, you know, I remember the first meeting that I went to, the coaches meeting, and it was just – a mess. Um, it was mad chaos. Yep. The coaches talked through the entire thing. You, right. You, and I remember at one point, one of the board members at the time screamed at everybody just to try to get control of the room. Right. Uh, the other side of that is only probably 30% of the coaches were there. Mm -hmm. And so there was just uh, a lot of opportunity. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And um, the guy that was the president at the time had just taken over and he, his son had played with us on that team we had played with. And so that's how I knew him. Mm -hmm. And I, it's funny because I remember not long after I came to MYBA, me and my family or my girlfriend and her son at the time, we were sitting at a restaurant in South Arlington and just sat down to eat dinner. And all of a sudden I saw the MYBA board members coming in. They were having a board meeting. Mm -hmm. They were using a little extra room over there at that Dickies on Cooper. Yeah. And I remember, I don't know what it was, but I felt a calling at that moment. I don't even know where it came from, but I told her at that moment, I said, I feel like I, I'm, I feel called to be a part of that. I feel called to be a part of the board and I didn't do anything with it, but I told her that that day. And then at the end of that season, uh, the guy that I just mentioned that had taken over, he called me and he was just spent. Right. He said, I just wanted you to be the first to know uh, I'm resigning. I, I can't do it anymore. He said, there's, there's things, some things that need to change. He said, MYBA really needs you to, to come be a part of this. And it was weird because I'd never told anybody other than my girlfriend that, yeah. that I felt a calling to do that. And here they were, he was calling me like he didn't even know me that well, except for being a fellow parent on another team. He said, you really need to be a part of this. And uh, so I think, <clears throat> I can't remember if they reached out to me. I think I may have reached out to them and just said, Hey, um, I just learned that he's resigning. Um, if I'm interested in learning more about the board process and being on the board, whatever. So they invited me to the next meeting. Long story short, uh, I got voted in that night, um, to take over as the president and then voted in by the coaches later at the meeting. So wait, wait, wait. So you, you had not served on the board at not, not at all one time. I had not been a commissioner. I had not been on the board. I had not served in any capacity except to be a head coach for, I think, one or two seasons. So you coached one or two seasons. Mm -hmm. You knew the former president um, just via playing one on the team. He was there for us. He was there for one. Right. He was there for one uh, season. The 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 president before him. I'm aware of who he is. But yeah. I really wasn't friends with him or anything. And then the board members. There wasn't a board member that wanted to be president. Like I mean, not that that you know matters or doesn't matter. But you like you literally went in the first day and they were like, "Hey, we're going to make you president," even though you no, it wasn't that easy. They I, re I they were going to run without a president, basically. Okay. And I, I had like I said, I I felt something in me calling me to do this. So I reached out to them and said, "Hey, I know that he's resigning. I'm trying not to name names, but he's yeah. resigning." And I'm interested in yeah. the position. Maybe, maybe I don't even know if I was or not. I want right. to learn more about it. You yeah, know, yeah. I've learned about it. So, yeah, I'm not doing that. But uh, <clears throat> they said, sure, come on. Why don't you come on in and we'll talk. And we went into the meeting. And uh, after talking for a little while, um, they voted me in. Because yeah, wow. honestly, at the time, the president, to be honest with you, the president was really just a figurehead, figurehead piece, whatever. It was the with. mouth of the association, basically. Yeah. And everybody else was running it. Yeah. 
You know about and how many so kids it was pretty had easy point? for them to say, yeah, let's let this guy handle all the phone calls and the emails. Because I'll be honest with you, one of the things that the outgoing president told me, he said, I'm going to tell you right now, if you take this, be prepared. It will overwhelm your life right. with phone calls and emails. And all. he goes, that's part of the reason why I'm leaving. It's just too much. Yeah. And he was right. Yeah. The minute I got voted in and was a part of it, I got swamped. Yeah. And I came from a business background and immediately things start jumping out with to me that it doesn't have to be like this. Right. There can be a better process. Yeah. 80, 80 to 90 percent of everything everybody was asking me was the same questions. Right. And none of it was on the website. Right. None of it. And yeah. so I'm like, let's answer these questions on the website and cut down. So immediately I found out who's the webmaster, who's right. got to, and I, I, Got out as an admin. I immediately start going in there and reshaping the the website to answer a lot of these questions. And immediately that stuff started toning down Easy, because yeah. we were pushing people to the website and they were getting the information they needed. So there just needed to be some organization and some things like that. Um, but yeah, that's how I ended up on the board. Well, I see, um, you know, I, like I said, when I came in, started working with you guys on the board and then uh, doing the football organization stuff, I see a lot of I've come across a lot of leagues and a lot of organizations and people that run organizations and what you tend to find out, especially, and this happens a lot in baseball, I think specifically because you get guys that, and I, when I say organization, it doesn't even have to be a, you know, a league. It could be a club. It could be a group that has four or five teams at different age groups, but you get a lot of dads that have a passion for baseball or for whatever. Um, maybe they like to be in charge of stuff or whatever the case may be. And they get involved, but they run it like they kind of run their lives, which it get, it's, it's chaotic. Uh, there's very little communication. Uh, there's not a lot of um, interaction with, you know, we'll call them the customers, your parents, the people that are paying you or, or being involved in your group or whatever. And so when you actually have somebody that has a business background, like you did, um, that steps into an organization and goes, okay, wait a minute, like we need to run this. This isn't the backyard association, especially because we're growing. We need to operate this like a business. This needs, you know, there needs to be accountability. There needs to be financials. All those things need to occur. Um, those are the ones that you tend to see have much greater success because it's approached that way. And it's not approached just like as a hobby. Yeah, honestly, I think that's what really took us to the next level. And when you when you have people volunteering their time to be to do things like be on the board or be a commissioner or whatever, there's different types of people. You have you, you know, you kind of mentioned hinted at somebody like me who just is gravitated to leadership positions. Yeah. But you have also people I that work. do it for selfish reasons. Yeah. You know, I, I want to get my kid into the best Got gotcha. you on the best team. team. Yeah. Or I want to be able to get the best players. And then you have those volunteers that it just sounds cool yeah. and they have zero qualification whatsoever. And right. that's where you tend to get a lot of chaos and, un, and being unorganized and someone that doesn't really have the skill sets to get things organized. And so, you know, <clears throat> I think we were very fortunate over the years to get a collection of people together like yourself, you know, mm -hmm. Mike served on the board with us for several years and was a commissioner before that. It takes some, what's, what really is important about running an organization like this and, and probably most any organization to, to have great success for the organization and for the organization to really thrive and be, be healthy and strong is you have to be able to separate your own personal gains, your own personal um, um, benefits. It benefits anything like that because there's been several times where I personally had to make decisions that didn't benefit my team. Right. It benefited the organization it, it it was to the negative to my team, but it was good for the organization. Maybe it was yeah. better for the, the rec divisions because my team's always played in the, the select divisions. But you ha it's very, very hard to separate yourself from that. And a lot of people can't because in the back of their mind, they're thinking, I'm giving how my does, time. How does this can. impact me? Yeah. How does this impact me? Yeah. And um, well, it's I mean, it's very similar to business. I mean, especially restaurants. Right. I, I always would associate the. You know, restaurants are always really hard to run because you have a lot of um, theft because you have you have items that sit in your fridge, you have food and you have cash. And whenever you have food and cash and you have a bunch of employees, theft is always a concern. Right. And so what happens is even well-intended people will put themselves in a bad position and, and be involved in something like that in a restaurant because they feel like they deserve it. You know what I mean? Well, in the in the the restaurant business there, I think there's a couple of different kinds of thieves, really. Sure. They are thieves. Um, 
there's one thief that, like you said, thinks they deserve it. I work here. I deal with this stuff every day. Yes. I can take food home. I can yes. take cash home. I'm not doing anything uh, wrong. They, like, they, I've earned it. They, pr they program themselves to, to believe that's okay because yeah. they're, they're part of the system basically. Yeah. But then there's also thieves that just need opportunity. And oh, sure. one of the things I used to spend quite a bit of time uh, coaching our managers on was reducing the window of opportunity because, and I used to describe it like this. I would say, look, let me tell you this. <clears throat> right now, if you were to put a $100 bill on your front counter of the restaurant, but you stood there like this and you watched it, you could probably make sure it'd be there the rest of the day. Yeah. If you put it on the counter and turned your back for the rest of the day and only glanced at it every once in a while, you still might be there at the end of the day, maybe. If you decided to go work in the back of the restaurant, and came back at the end of the day to see if it was there, probably won't be there. Right. So those are windows of opportunity. And right. so what we always try to do is make that window small, as small as we can, because if it gets big enough, people jump through it. Even yeah. honestly, what normally would be good people, yeah, honest it's human people, nature. it's like, holy cow, I'm in the middle of a desert yeah. and there's a bag of money sitting right there. No one's been here for a year. Well, the way I would, used, you, would you take it? Yeah. Well, the way you I say, used to but, explain, but, but if you're in the same scenario where you're driving through the desert and traffic's going, meow, 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 and you see a bag of money on the road, you might try to get to the rifle owner, but you probably wouldn't take it. No. Well, that's the same thing. It's well, windows of opportunity. It's like if if the opportunity exists, and I think there's really no way anyone else is ever even going to know about this. Some people that normally would not have will now take that opportunity. Well, and it's not even, I, I don't even think sometimes it's always malicious. It gets that way, but I don't think that's where it starts. Because exactly. what I used to say was, I would use this, it was very funny, I'd use the same analogy to some extent about $100, but I would put it in 20s. And I would say, if you had five $20 bills sitting on a table and you have somebody running your restaurant for you and you leave, and that it could be your brother, your best friend, it doesn't matter who it is. Um, and something you run out of milk, you run out of cheese, you run out of whatever. And that person's got to take that money and go purchase it because you're not there or you're mm -hmm. not able to do it or whatever. And then they come back and it gets busy or whatever and they forget to put it back. It, again, no malice, no nothing. It was just the course of the day occurred where they for, they weren't able to put that money back because they were like, I'll put it back later once I get it. And then maybe nobody notices or it comes up short a little bit, but nobody says anything about it or whatever. So I like, forgot to bring that back. You're like, Oh, I totally forgot about yeah. that. And then you go back again the next time and they, again, no intent, but this yeah, time they're that's like, how it starts. yeah. Oh, well, I got to go get this. And that's what know. I say. There's different kinds of thieves because yeah. one thief just looks for opportunity. Yeah. And then another thief, the opportunity just gets so blatant that it makes it really hard for some people yeah. to still do the right thing. You know, they say you do the right thing when nobody's looking. Some people, like if they just really think, Nobody is ever going to be looking at this. Yeah. Good people will do bad things sometimes in, in those situations. Well, in that same, I don't know if you want to call it a trade or behavior or whatever, bleeds over into what we were talking about, about, you know, when you bring people into organizations, larger organizations that have, you know, a lot of moving parts and a lot of, a lot of things happening, that same like feeling of either they deserve it or they have mal or whatever it, that happens there too. And so it's okay, well, you know, I'm going to, make sure that my team gets this uniform. I'm going to make sure that, you know, we change the rule in this division. So my team, and it's, it's not always malicious. It's just that it's so hard to watch out for that because it is a pretty common human behavior. And it's, it's hard to find people to get involved in organizations where there's money coming through that you don't, uh, that you can trust and make sure that they're going to be taken care of because, you know, you, it, it's it's just there and you have to be aware of it. And that's why it's hard to find really, really good yeah, people to it's, do stuff. It's so. human nature yeah. to think about yourself for, or think about Absolutely. me. Yep. But that, I think that's what really has uh, not only strengthened MYBA, but you know, MYBA is one of the few organizations that's really standing the test of time right now. Yes. Um, <clears throat> a lot of organizations are shrinking big time. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, MYBA is positioned in a good place. And, and the reason we've been kind of immune to that shrinkage is for a couple of reasons. One, I think people appreciate what we do. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, you know, the, the hardest part about making people understand is that it's not just about their child. And so over all my 15 years of being here every once in a while, you know, I usually just get lots of positive vibes from people. Sure constantly thank you this is you guys are doing great all these great things yeah every i very rarely while, come across bad stuff yeah every once in a while i'll have somebody say something to me about like oh i work with so-and-so that used to play with myba well she really doesn't like you and i'm like 
I, it's somebody, I can remember somebody saying this to me one time and uh, it's happened two or three times. I'm like, what do you mean they don't like me? I mean, I, I've come not, across not, that. That, not that everybody has to like me, but it makes me wonder what happened about baseball that made them not like me. And they're like, ah, I don't know. I don't know what happened. But they just have a sour taste in their mouth for They mentioned you by name. And I'm like, okay, so I'll go home and I'll Google that person's name. Not Google. I'll look them up in my email uh, search. Cause I have every email ever, ever. And I'll find their name. And sure enough, every single time it's because that person wanted me to treat their player different than every other player in the league. Right. And the a number one complaint is someone gets on a team they everything's great, but then all of a sudden they don't agree with how much play time their son's getting or where he bats in the order, or you know, they brought something up to the coach and they didn't like the way the coach responded. Now what they do is they reach out and say, I want to be on a different team. Yeah. That's the A number one. It doesn't happen a whole lot. Like every season, it's about five people, yeah. five to six people. But those five or six people make such a big deal about it, and they don't understand why they can't move to another team. Now, if we didn't have the rules and the policies in place that we do, it'd be way more than five or six. Right. Because here's what would happen. They want me to say, oh, you know what? That's not working out. Let's just move you over to this team that could take on another player. No big deal. Finish the season with them. Here's the problem. If you let one person do that, you have to let everybody do that. Yes. And so now every time there's so many different situations, Yeah. you and I are on one team together um, and our kids are walking out and we just had a great game. But then another coach comes up and says, Hey, I noticed you got your kids play left field and, and uh, center field on, on the Padres over there. How would you like to play shortstop and third? Right. Because I need one. I need shortstop third. I had two kids quit. So that coach is going to now try to take us from the team we're on. And if we say yes, now the team we came from is shorthanded. Right. And it just, it snowballs. It snowballs, yeah. And it, and that kind of stuff happens. Mm -hmm. You know, you take your kid to the batting cage and some of it, cause that's a lot of times how coaches network. Sure. Hey, kids, Looking pretty good. Does yeah. he play? Oh, yeah, he plays for the Red. Yeah. If you guys are looking for another team next season, hit us up. We're yeah. having trials. That's how that happens. Well, that happens at the park, too, and so or, or even at the hitting facility. And that literally I've had parents at, tell me, oh, me and two other parents from the team, we ran into the coach of the da-da-da last night at the batting cages, and he really would like for our kids to come play for him, so we want to switch teams. Right. So they think that I should be able to take those three kids off of the team they're on, put them on another one. because I And, and what I've had to explain to them, I'm like, look, you, d you don't want to agree with the fact that we won't let you switch teams, but I guarantee you if I allowed this to happen and you were on a team that you were happy with, yeah. but four players were now leaving to go to another team and y'all were going to be shorthanded and now you're going to be four games, you'd still be complaining to me about why we allowed that. Yeah, yeah. So it's really my point is it's really hard to find people that can think about the big picture, yeah, not just think about themselves. Because yeah. like I said, I had to be a part of making decisions in the past that wasn't necessarily in my team or even my son's best interest. Mm -hmm. But it was what's in the best interest of the the association, and and those are the people that can that can really do a great job on a board, yeah. uh, or at least having that. It's 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 really it's necessary because if you don't, the wrong decisions get made. And I think some of that was happening before I was at MYBA. Is I don't think people had ill will or ill intentions, but they were misguided because of their own personal gains that were behind the decisions they were making. Right, and we really had to start pulling ourselves out of it and making sure that we weren't making decisions that were in our best interest. Cause some of that was happening. I remember um, the guy that was the uh, secretary at the time when I took over, he really was just a follower. He did a bunch. He worked really hard, super nice guy. And I remember we had a different system uh, for running the draft back then. All the kids went into a, a program that a former board member had built. That was amazing. And, uh, I was go scrolling through all the kids' um, registrations, and I saw a note in the notes column. I would see things like, "Make sure they end up on this team. Make sure they end up on this team. Make sure they end up on this team." I'm like, "What is this? Like, this is a random draft. How right. do you have make sure they're on this team? Make sure on that team?" So I called him and I said, "Hey, man, what what are these notes? I don't understand." He goes, "Well, those are where uh, certain coaches have asked for these certain players or that player, you know." And and I said well, we don't, this is a random draft. We can't do, it's no longer random if you're doing things like, he really got um, distraught by it because he got, he felt like he was stuck in the middle. He's like, look, I'm just doing what I'm told by other people. Yeah. And I said, we can't do it. I went out and I deleted them. I said, absolutely, we're not doing this. Yeah. There's a way for people to influence or pick which team they're going to be on. But if you sign up for the draft, yeah. You don't get to say, I only want to play on this team. That's right. not a draft. Right. And so it's things like that that give the league 
major integrity mm -hmm. because we don't. We do not influence the draft. Right. If you're not on a team, you go into a pool and the computer randomly assigns you to a team. It's a right. random draft. And as soon as we start having people saying, well, just make sure I don't play for this coach. I, I want to make sure we're on this team. Our coaches will send, even now it still happens. Occasionally somebody will say, hey, I protected my max. I can't add any more players, but I really want this kid who played for me last year. You need to move up and yeah. play in a select division because that's what those are. You, that would be a select team right. if I let you do that. And so you signed up for a non-select division. You select for a draft league. So it's stuff like that that it's re everybody likes to think about me and and how it influence when I say me themselves, how it influences them. And it's really hard to pull yourself out of that. It really is. Well, it's tough because when like in that situation with the draft, whenever you have parents from the outside looking in and they don't know, you know. It, there's been so much stuff throughout, you know, different youth sports organizations over the years that everybody always just has a little bit of distrust for things. They're just like, well, you know, especially when things aren't going their way, right? You know, my team's not very good. That well, why is that team so good? They must have cheated. They they had to have done something, and so they make those assumptions automatically in their brain that oh, well, this you know, there's definitely some, you know, people do make assumptions about things. how things are working, but there's things like that that I think we do a pretty good job of educating people how that works. I rarely get that. I, well, no, but that's, I, yeah. I don't know if anybody's ever said this is a draft league. How did that team get so good? Cause people understand how it works and they see that it works that way. We right. really do have a random draft. No, but that's my, my point. My point is, is that with NYBA, it was never that situation. Oh, right, right. Like I, I was there, I experienced it. I went through it. So it never became a problem because you guys stuck to your guns because you're like, Hey, look, regardless of the situation, regardless of in, and that's the uncomfortable part sometimes is there are situations that come up that you can say, I mean, I understand where you're coming from. Oh man, from. they lay the guilt trips on yes. big time. I'll have a parent say, look, my son is on a team, got drafted to a team that's been together all this time, or maybe even a select team yeah. that they signed up for. We yeah. met this coach and my kid plays right field every single game, but there's another coach that will put him at shortstop. It right. would be so great for his development. It'll be, it's a much better coach and he'll get to play a better position and he's going to bat higher in the lineup. It'll be so great for my kid. Right. But I have to say no. Right. Because if I jerk. do it for that, exactly, yes. they just cannot take themselves out of it. Yeah. And then I become, then the, then the emails turn hateful. Right. And what's the number one? You're going to be able to answer this question, I guarantee you. Mm -hmm. When they, this, the, almost every single time, if I send a parent the response that they don't want. Yes. That they asked, and I gave them the response that wasn't the one they wanted. Right. They respond back with, wait a minute, I thought it was. All about the kids. Exactly. Yeah. Every yeah. single time. <laughs> yes. It's in our logo. Yes. It's all about the ki kids. Yeah. Yes. And that's what they, they think they can leverage that. Yes. I thought it was all about the kids. Yeah. And I always respond back and I say, it absolutely it's is, but it's kids. about all the kids. Right. It's all about yeah. all kids. Yeah. And I can't, we can't, those people, those few people that have gotten upset, it's usually because they want us to make exceptions for their child. Yeah. And we just can't because it, the only way to be fair about that is do it for everybody. And it, it, which I think when you, when people lose scope sometimes, how many just, I, I know the number changes, but let's just say in the spring season, when it's the busiest, about how many kids are, are we sit, are you guys sitting at right now? 1400, okay. 1500. And it, it kind of bounces between 1300 and 1600. In the and then in the state of Texas, when we're talking about a youth organization, like tied to cities, like this one is, there aren't that many that have that kind of size. I mean, in the, in the entire state, I'm not aware of a single youth baseball association, just baseball only. Right. That is larger than us in the state of Texas. I'm not aware of one. Now there might be, you know, people will say, Oh yeah, but this, look at this tournament, this tournament. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that's a tournament. Right. I'm talking about rec baseball league. Right. I believe I, I'm not, I'm not saying there's not one, but I'm not aware You're of not a single aware. one that has more uh, participants. And I, like what I was kind of getting at earlier is that I think the way we do things is a part of that. Oh yeah, absolutely. We also have an advantage that you know if if there's an association down the road that gets down to, you know, five or six hundred players, which a lot of them are now. Well, they can't offer variety. Right. At fifteen hundred kids, you can have an not a only division, not only can your division. nine year old yeah. play just with nine year olds, yeah, but they can play in the beginner division, the A rec division. Yeah. They can play in a select division that's a rec division. Or they can play in the double A comp division with straight up double A. There's three different divisions, three different yep. skill levels just at nine U. Whereas when you got 500 kids in the association, it's like, 12 well, not only do we not have those three divisions, yep. but 12, 11s and 12s are going to play together. And if there's still not enough, we're going to add the nine year olds to them yep. or the, the 10 year olds. Mm -hmm. So we have, we do have a luxury being as big as we are that 
that we have that protection. But I also but that believe, was built. But that, yeah, it's because we run such a good yeah. program. But then we also have the situation where players from those other areas come play with us yep. because it is a better organization yeah. and it's run better. And we're not perfect. I will. I've never said to anybody, "Hey, we are the we are." I do believe we're the premier league. In uh, in Texas, or at least North Texas, uh, I'll never say that we're as good as it gets because I'm always looking for ways to be better. Yeah. Every single email that someone sends me, you and I talked about one earlier. Even that one is ridiculous. When somebody sends a suggestion, as ridiculous as that suggestion was, yeah, I still went. I still said, you know what? Maybe maybe I don't know. Let's yeah. ask the coaches. Yeah, and I went and talked to the coaches, and every one of them said, absolutely, that's ridiculous. So we we are always looking for ways to be better. And we do find ways to be better. Sometimes yeah. we'll hear about you know, either it's somebody's idea or something that they saw somewhere else and we'll implement that. But um, I think it's a pretty well oiled machine and people will ask me and I hopefully, I don't know if this is on your list or not, but people will ask me, man, what's the hardest part about running a league of that many kids? And there's, by the way, there's other associations that have like Burleson, mm -hmm. you know, they have those kinds of numbers, but they also have cheerleaders and softball and right. football. It's all of that. This yeah. is just, I'm talking just baseball. Yeah. They'll ask me, so what's the hardest part about running an association like that? Cause it's gotta just be so time consuming. Cause honestly it could be a full-time job for sure. But what I tell people is we really have running the organization down pretty well. It's not perfect. We're always looking to get better. It's a pretty well old machine. The hardest part about, my job mm -hmm. is running the adult daycare. Yeah. Yes. That's the hardest part. And, 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 and again, it's, you know, we have with, you know, if you have 1500 kids in a season, even if every uh, player only had two parents, you're talking about 3000 parents, yeah. but they have multiple parents. Step parents there's, yep. there's split families. Yep. So you're talking about on any given spring season, about 4,000 parents. Yeah. And out of 4,000 parents only having four or five. Yeah. That, that was are, my point. That are yeah. discontent. But the problem is those four or five are, are just a pain in the, you know, what they, <laughs> yeah. they love to just be the squeaky wheel and yeah. try to leverage and get their ways. And so you have to be not only thick skinned to that, but you have to learn how to address it and move on. Yeah. Uh, they, they almost always try to engage you. What they want you want to do is provoke you enough that you'll respond in a bad enough way that they can hold that against you. And yep. now they get their way. Yep. So we always, you know, I'm always, you know, and I have to remind myself this sometimes, but I'm always coaching others too. Don't let it get personal. You know, Nicole, who's our admin, mm -hmm. who does a great job. Um, every once in a while, somebody yes. will get under her skin. I'll yep. say, Hey, just don't let it get personal. It's not you. It's them J respond and, and just give them uh, I'll either take it over. Or I'll just tell them, just respond without, without emotion and move on. Well, that's what I learned working with you doing this. And that's why, you know, um, when, when we would sit in board meetings, there would be topics that would come up that we would say, and I can't think of one specifically, but, you know, maybe two or three of us would be like, no, I think we should do this. And you would be against it in that particular situation, but you were always open-minded to it. There was never a point where you would say, no, this is how we're going to do it. You know, there might've been a couple instances only when you were like, Hey, look, I've done this. I've tried this six times. This is what happened here. This yeah. is what happened here. You know, that happened for sure. But just the just the willingness to hear the opinions to, and, and like you said earlier, you sent the email out. Okay, well, I don't agree with this at all, but let me see what everybody else thinks. Maybe I don't know everything. Right. You know what I mean? And and I think that um, that gets miscon. There's a little bit of a misconception about you sometimes because you know you're very open to all kinds of ideas and different ways to do things. But when you've been doing something for 15 years. You learn some stuff. Yeah. And the same situations have come up a few times. So you've kind of gone through this enough to know. Yeah, like and that's what I'll do is I, I like to, I, I think a great leader, what part of what makes a great leader is, is recognizing the fact that although a great leader usually has to have some great ideas, not all the great best ideas come from you. Yeah. And so you have to surround yourself people with people that have great ideas. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's really a bad characteristic for a leader to, you know, pull rank or my way or the highway. And I don't think I've ever once pulled rank. I've never had been on the other side of the aisle and just said, you know what, we're going to do it no matter what. I've never done that. There's yeah. been times where I've said, look, I want to do what the majority. Did. There's been several times where I've said, we'll do what the majority wants to do. Yep. Here's my opinion. And we would do it. And most of the time I was right. Yes. Uh, but sometimes I'm sure I wasn't. And, uh, but yeah, I think you have to be able to do that, but that does happen sometimes where yeah. someone that comes in, I've been doing this for 15 years and you got somebody that comes along. So I've been a part of the association for a year and they're like, yeah. Oh, why don't we just halfway through the season let everybody switch teams if they want? Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me kind of clue you <laughs> in on what would happen. Right. And I give them that same scenario. You yeah. coach a team, right? Yeah. 
what if we said there's going to be a free agency for a week in the middle of the season and five of your players decided to go play for somebody else because for whatever reason, they just didn't want to play for you. Yeah, They didn't like you as a coach. They can go play better position, whatever. They, five players left. Mm -hmm. Now what? Right. And, every, and they're like, I'd have to start forfeiting games. That's right. Yeah. yeah. First, first, though, they would say something like, well, and why be able to give me five more? No, they might be done have five more. We don't yeah. have kids sitting there just we're Waiting. saying, hey, just wait. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll call you if we need you. Uh, so you have to help people see through. And then they're like, oh, I didn't think about that. I didn't really think it through. But, yeah, there's been lots of things that through trial and error we've learned over the years. And there's a wealth of knowledge that a lot of us have. There's lots of things I'm sure that you know that you know, somebody new to the organization wouldn't know. And, well, I mean, when I came in originally, I'm sure, and I don't even remember all of it, but I'm, you know, I always have ideas about things and I just, re I remember, you know, they always say, you remember how you feel about things, not necessarily the details of everything that happens all the time. Uh, we use that a lot in my business because we talk about making people happy with the experience because they don't remember every detail about their loan or buying the house, but they realize at the end that, man, this was a good experience mm -hmm. or it wasn't. And um, my experience in dealing with you is that I'm sure I had a bunch of, oh, we should try this and we should try this and we should try this because I know I'm that way. And every single time that I remember, it was always like, okay, well, that's not bad. Or what I really learned from you was the, okay, great. So what are you going to do? Like, how are you going to do it? Yeah, tell me how that's going to happen. That that was the thing that I ran into the hardest part running the football organization when I did it. And I, but I already knew it. So it was good going in because of you was people would come in all the time. We'd add board members and like, we should do this. We should do this. We should do this. And I would go, great. When are you going to start? Like, what, <laughs> what's, what are you going to do to make that happen? And then that tends to kind of quell the ideas a little bit. And you kind of at least got to be a part of the solution to that idea. Right. Or executing it. And, uh, you know, and there's lots of things we can get into the whole, you know, struggle with volunteers, but things like, you know, I, it's always been one of my dreams um, to do a big opening day. Um, yeah. And we've, we've tried to do it twice. And that here's the thing about volunteers is all throughout the season, as I'm helping people. Well, and real you know, quick before you go down yeah, that road, yeah. I want to, I want you to talk about how everybody in the league, except for two people are volunteers are volunteers. Yeah. So we have the, umpires, nobody gets paid. The umpires, nobody. Are paid, the umpires are paid. And then the director of umpires is paid. Our admin is paid. And then we pay someone to run uh, concessions. Right. And so there's reasons for that. Everybody else, coaches, commissioners, board members, president, nobody's getting paid. In right. fact, to be honest with you for 15 years now, I've been paying to be the president because it costs me money. Yeah. It costs me gas money. Yeah. Uh, especially if I have to pick up the, ranger and take it to the shop over in haltom city i don't expense that to the organization right uh in fact when i uh when my son was playing one one of the very there's very few perks to being on the board or being a commissioner but one of the few is that your player plays for free yeah i never took that i always paid for my son to play only because I never wanted people to question why I was doing it. Oh, he's doing it for the perks. No, I always paid for my son to play in the football league. There's not every year. really any perks. There's a few, yep. but I don't even take those. Yep. So it costs me money to do it because I want to do it for the right reasons. But yeah, uh, a lot of times I think people, I'll never forget. Actually, it happened a couple of weeks ago where someone called me. And a lot of times if I don't recognize the number, I won't answer it only because it's probably some a random Spam. pair from baseball. Oh, and I so I can get back to him really quick, really right. quickly, but I'm at work right now or whatever. But I actually happened to answer this call and the guy said, Hey, I sent an email. Nobody ever responded. Uh, I can't remember what it was about. Let's just say it was, um, maybe it was a coach wanting to pick up rings at the end of the season. I'm just making that up. But they, they said, I sent an email. Nobody's responding. I'm like, Oh, well, because I'm, I, that's one of the things I, th I pride myself on. We're pretty good with communication. Yeah. It's usually the very first compliment somebody gives us when they first come to MYBA. Is say, man, the communication here is great. It's right. very well organized. Communication is great. So I hated to hear that. The guy's saying, I'm seeing, I sent an well, email. Ball so drops sometimes. Immediately I'm it's thinking, normal. oh, maybe it went to spam. What happened? Yeah. And I said, oh, well, I'm sorry. I said, uh, what's your name? And so I, I opened up an email. And before I could even search, I saw that he just sent the email 20 minutes before that. <laughs> And it's like, I think people really don't realize that this isn't my job. Yeah. You know, I have a full-time job. I run a business. At one time I ran a, you know, 110 restaurant, uh, restaurants, restaurant chain up to 110 restaurants at one time. Um, I'm not doing this. I'm not getting paid and I'm not doing this full time. I'm squeezing it in. Yeah. But in my free time. And, uh, 
So sometimes we do have to remind people that, and I don't throw it in people's face because I signed up for this. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I don't complain about it. No. I am not complaining that I have to spend my free time running this. I signed up for this, but I asked for a little, because I honestly, I reply to emails probably as quickly as most people reply to text. Yeah. I'm yeah. Still pretty quick with it, but some people are just very, you know, there was somebody not too long ago started emailing on a Saturday night because he couldn't get a hold of anybody. And I'm like, it's Saturday night, you know, right. nobody's at the, they were complaining because they can't get hold of Nicole. Yeah. I've emailed Nicole twice and she's not emailing back. I'm like, well, the website clearly says she's a part-time employee that works Monday through Friday, normally nine to one. Yeah. This is Saturday night. Right. So, um, yeah, it's a great reminder. Yeah. I, I don't get paid to do this. You know, and when I first came to MYBA, there was not a paid admin. There was a paid director of umpires and the umpires got paid. And let me tell you, let me touch on that real quick. Why we pay the umpires because, Hey, the, the umpire well, business is tough. Yeah, right I was about now. to say. Uh, That's you, a whole other podcast. Yes, yes. We, can we bring, have a shortage we of can umpires. Bring Scott Amma, Amma shortage of that. There's a yeah. huge short. There's a shortage of everything right now. Every official. But every every league. Football, basketball, baseball, every and, sport. Uh, and there's reasons for that. Exactly. Much. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. But, you know, you can go up the road to some of the other associations, and when your game is being called on Saturday, it's being called by a, dad. a fellow coach, yeah. a, a dad in the league, and their son. Yeah. And which is great. You know, yeah, that's true. like I said, the YMCA serves a purpose Right. at NYBA. What we want is we want officials that have been through training. Don't have any kind of skin in the game. Yeah. Uh, you're getting a real umpire. So we do pay the umpires and they all go through training. And I always have to remind people because somebody will say, you know, anytime somebody complains about a call in a game, every time I always, I already know right away who lost. Yes. Of course. Rarely does a coach call and say, Hey, I had a great game tonight. I won, but by the way, the umpire stinks. Yeah. That doesn't happen. It's always because right. they lost the game, but, um, which doesn't you know, mean by the way, umpires make mistakes. Exactly. That's what all I the tell time. Them. I'm like, look in major league baseball, yes. that is the elite. Yes. Like every umpire, like if their dream is to umpire for a career is to get to the major leagues, that's the best of the best. And now they have instant replay. Yes. And still then sometimes the get next day people are going, they got this wrong. Yes. Even with instant replay, they got it wrong. So our umpires don't have that. It's yes. usually some, uh, a young, you know, 16 year old kid who played Bay baseball. baseball player. And yeah. now it's his first job is calling games. Yeah. We have uh, people that have been calling umpires for a while. We've got people that retire. They, yeah. they, from 16 to, to 60, we have people out and, there calling and games. They get paid. But they don't get paid that yeah, much. They're not making so a living much. at it. Yes. They're doing just, it as a, for a hobby. It's a for little fun. bit. Of a, it, they, it's a gift, a token of appreciation. Yes. For coming in and doing the game. But mo yes. I would say 90% of those guys are doing it just because they love being at a youth baseball game. Yeah. And so that's why they do that. Um, so, yeah, we pay, we've always paid them. Uh, it wasn't long after I'd been here. I, uh, you know, back in the day, the concession stand was run by volunteers. And so every season, it was kind of a lottery. Every team, you know, it got to a point where we had more teams than we had spots nights that there were games. So, because yeah. uh, we were growing so fast, so some teams didn't get it, but most teams had one night they had to cover concession stand. Yeah. Well, the problem with that is every night you got new people running it, so yep. it's never going to run well ever. It's nope. brand. It's imagine going to McDonald's and every single day, it's, all, new. all the employees change the manager and everybody. Yeah. So we had new employees every single day, so that wasn't good. Nobody wanted to do it. No. It so was they, being forced upon we started them. offering a buyout thing where it's like, Hey, if your team doesn't want to do it, if they just want to pay the, I don't remember what it was a hundred dollars for the night. So teams started doing that. Like, Hey, when nobody wants to work it, let's just pay Everybody put in 10 bucks and we'll pay it. Where so many teams doing that said, look, I came from the restaurant business. Let's just run it like a restaurant. Yes. Let's, let's put the products in there. People want, let's price it accordingly. And then let's get some kids in there working their first job. Yeah. And it works out perfect. Yes. So now nobody has to work a session stand. They can go watch their kids game. Um, which especially in Mansfield parents love my, my yeah. wife's on the, uh, booster club for Wester, Wester Wildcats. Exactly. And, uh, uh, she's president of booster club and having finding parents to run concession stands at the junior high right. games. And now she's involved with the high school watch. Cause we do volleyball too, is the bane of her existence because it, and I get it. Nobody wants to do it. And the whole thing about volunteers, what I was going to say about why you have to have some people that have jobs that are paid is because, and I used to tell the board this with the football association, I would say, what are, what are you going to do? Like if, if, if the volunteer doesn't show up and doesn't come in to do what you need to, them to do, right. what, what are you going to fire the volunteer? Like, I don't know. Like well, that, what you, plus, I mean, we got to a size where it just wasn't fair to expect somebody to do the yes. job. For, without any pay yes uh, there's a lot so, of like, well yeah especially we, we eventually not only we pay people to 
to work the concession stamp. We needed somebody to manage that. And yeah. So we started paying a director of concessions. Yeah. Um, and so, and then eventually we grew to the point where we needed an admin. Yes. It's like, look, there's just, it's a lot of people. There's, there's, even if we did a good job of putting things on the website and cutting down on the email, but again, with 1500 players, 4,000 parents in the league, even if only 5% of them are sending you an email, yeah. you know, that's a lot of emails. And so well, plus all the board members are all volunteers. So exactly. they're all at their Everybody's job and running, they're working. And most of us run our run businesses. Yes. You know, you had your own business. Mm -hmm. Dwayne has his own business. Chris has his own business. Um, uh, uh, Daniel's a full-time pastor. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, we, we needed to hire a part-time admin and, and Nicole's been great. That's been a huge, uh, benefit to the association and we didn't do it to make being on the board easier we did it because the association had grown so much it was just the right thing to do yeah we weren't you know when nyba started back in the 70s or whenever it was you know it, for years it was just you know in fact back then i don't know if you know this or not that when baseball started it was when nyba started it was everything it was basketball oh really it was baseball huh. i think they even did girls softball for a while but then as it grew a little bit mansfield baseball uh, whatever it's called. I don't even know if it, I don't think it exists anymore, but it did for a while. The basketball association did. Oh um, yes. I, or, yeah. And so, did. Soft girls, softball, all that kind of peeled off. Um, so I guess probably in the beginning it was called Mansfield Youth Association or something, but, yeah. um, but yeah, we grew to the point where just like there was a need to run it. Honestly, I think even the smallest of associations should run it like a business, but, uh, in that same wheelhouse, we, we needed to bring on an admin. So yeah, like I said, it's, it's a pretty well old machine and everybody um, knows their duties. One of the, the other greatest things I think we did early on uh, was there were co always commissioners, but when I got here, the commissioners really didn't do anything except get to pick the players they want in the fields they wanted to practice on. That was, yeah. they weren't doing anything. Right. And uh, so we restructured what a commissioner's duties were and made it worth doing. Mm -hmm. And honestly, the greatest benefit to being a commissioner, aside from, you know, fulfilling your desire to be, to have a servant heart is being able to network, mm -hmm. you know, being the president yeah, of MYBA, of I knew tons of people. So yeah. if I ever did need a player, yeah, I knew who didn't have a team and who yeah. was out there and they knew me and yeah. it made it very easy. So that's honestly one of the the great things about being a commissioner is being able to network and, yeah. and, and meet and, and learn so many people. It really helps you be able to put together a decent team. So as big as the organization is today, it, it actually is smaller than what it has been in the past. Um, and you've been doing this for, you know, like I said, 15 years, but, but overall, you know, you start to see, I, I dealt with it very heavily in football um, for many, many reasons, but um, overall you start to see a little bit of a decline in participation. Um, now I think baseball is a little different in that baseball has very much become um, even more so than I think some of the other sports of business, because there are so many little baseball clubs where you pay to be on this team and you pay to be on that team and you play in these tournaments. And, you know, I, I experienced double A tournaments or triple A tournaments and major tournaments. And, you know, you go to some of these double A tournaments and you really have a bunch of rec kids out there that are playing in this tournament, getting destroyed because you didn't have but teams. Able to say should, they play the tournament. Right. But they're on this select team and they do it. So there's, there's an aspect of that for sure. Um, I don't want to get into the way into that, but, but really and truly, why do you think, we've seen a decline overall in in sports participation especially with with all of the benefits i mean that i think that yeah. you know playing sports gives kids yeah i think i have a good theory on that uh, and before i jump into that i do want to say that you know myba spiked in uh participation up around 2200 kids at one time it lasted for about a year or two but what happened after that is the other associations started taking notes yeah like there's one down the street that basically just tried to clone what we were doing and right. so we took a bunch of kids from other associations all at one time yeah. and then they started, started changing their programs and they yeah. got some of them back. So we've actually been at, you know, for spring season around 1400, 1500 kids for a oh, wow. very long time now. Now you may say, well, that's not, there's no growth there. Well, well but we're not shrinking. Other, yeah. We're not shrinking and everybody around us is. Yeah. And the pool and, of and kids it's not is just less. baseball. Yeah. It's softball, uh -huh. softballs and, and, and really, um, you know, it's a scary situation. The numbers that they've gotten down to, uh, they, they've made a quick, a comeback a little bit in the last couple of years, but girl softball is shrinking, uh, hockey participation, shrinking volleyball participation, shrinking football. And, uh, overall, yeah. there are fewer kids playing youth sports than there used to be. And some people will say, Oh, it's cause they're all playing select. No, 
They were playing select one. Yeah. Fifteen years ago, there were select teams too, and select teams outgrew. So I think it was that a little happened. different, but but because I, I think there's more because it's more of a all, business now. There's always been, there's always been um, a mentality that if you're going to make the high school team, you got to leave rec ball. Yeah. which I do not agree with at all. I When I coached my kids, no one ever paid me to coach. Mm -hmm. It was not a paid situation. And again, I'm not knocking these clubs or sure. anything like that. that yeah, yeah. That's great. I think they they fill a niche, and there are certain players that they benefit from being in. Yep. I would, that's not how I ran my teams. Nobody paid me. We played MYBA every single season. We played spring and we played fall. Mm -hmm. We'd play a couple of tournaments during the spring, during each one of those uh, seasons and we'd play world series in the summer yeah and that's all we did i didn't want to burn my kids out i didn't want to burn my parents out i didn't want to burn me out yeah. but i wanted to set them up to succeed and every single one of my players who played with me forever that tried out for the high school team every single one of them made it every yeah. single one of them and we never went to steamboat springs we never went down to florida right. we never did any of that yeah. and it, it always gets me because i'll hear of a team Oh, we're going to Steamboat this summer. I'm like, you're losing here. Yeah, <laughs> the teams here are beating you. Yes. I mean, I can understand. It. It's like, hey, look, it doesn't matter what tournament everybody. we play here. Yeah, we're beating everybody. We're dominating everybody. And then maybe you need to go see some new competition. But yeah. you're losing games here. Yeah, it's not about being able to face new teams all the time. It's just about get your kids on the field, throw yeah. the ball, hit the ball, catch the ball. That's yeah. what baseball is. Yeah. Get them out there playing ball. Get them, and that's why that was my mentality. Yeah. We'll play the play. MYBA league, but we'll play in the appropriate yeah. league. Just play a lot. By the time my kids were 13 years old, they were all playing in the high school division yeah. at MYBA because yeah. they were better than the rec teams that were in 13U, but there was a place for them still to play. So we never outgrew out of MYBA, but I do understand why some people leave. But the whole mentality of if you're not out playing tournaments every single weekend on a select team that you're paying $3,000 a season to be on, you're not going to make the high school team. That's baloney. Yeah. Uh, you're not going to make now, I'm not saying season, you're wasting you're your money. Enough. I'm just saying that's baloney. That's not <laughs> yeah. the only way to get there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you're right. There's, there are a lot of club teams and stuff like that, but here's the culprit in my opinion. And people at first can be like, that's not it. But if you think about it long enough and you think about examples of kids that, you know, personally, you'll start to agree with it. It's, it's electronics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's electronics. And, uh, my son has gone through, uh, you know, somewhat of uh what you might call an addiction to electronics I, most every kid does yep. and you know when i was a kid which was a long time ago everybody wanted to play baseball what else are you going to do you we mean, don't, you're if bored. i don't play baseball today i gotta go find a stick and yeah. draw, draw in the dirt you're or bored something. out of your mind i gotta find something to do well, you want to play baseball well now baseball's competing with gaming yeah mlb and youtube the show. Yeah. and and you know all these different things TikTok and making TikToks and all this, watching TikTok. And, and then also there's way more um, single parents and split families than there were when I was a kid. Also, yeah. I'm not saying they didn't exist, but it's way more prevalent now. And so if you can just imagine for a minute, a single mom who works a full-time job, that has a couple of kids and she's trying to do the right thing and put them into baseball or whatever. And every day she comes home and she says, Hey, it's, Every time when it's uh, practice day, it's time to go to practice and get ready. And the kid's like, I just want to, I just want to, mom, not tonight. I'm, I'm tired. tired. They say I'm tired. Yeah. But with that, I'm tired to a teenager or, or any, any child over about five. I'm tired means I want to play games. Yeah. I want to do, do something on my iPad. Yeah. And then mom's sitting here going, boy, what I wouldn't give to pour a glass of wine uh -huh. and turn on the Hallmark channel. Yep. And they get, and I'm not blaming moms at all. Dad's, yeah, yeah. Dad's, dad's the same too. thing. Yeah. Dad works all day long. I'm tired. Comes home. Like Jack and and even, even in, you know, fight families that haven't split up. Yeah. Dad comes home from working hard. Mom's been working hard. Mom wants to pour a glass of wine and dad wants to turn on sports center. And it's real. It gets real easy to say, okay, we won't go tonight. And then when it's next time it's ready to sign up, it's like, you didn't even go to half the practice last season. Let's just not pull, let's not register yep. that. I wholeheartedly believe, it's not 100% of the no, problem, no, no. but I believe it is the majority of the reason why fewer and fewer kids are playing youth sports is because parents, and I did it too. Mm -hmm. uh, it's I'm easier. Not, it's no, just, it's, it, it's, it becomes, you want to give your kids. If what our they parents want. had it, plus, they absolutely yeah, would have taken advantage of it. And plus you want to give your kids what they want. You don't yeah. want to feel like you're forcing them to play. And that's what ends up. That's what it ends up feeling like is because baseball and girls softball basketball and football is now competing with Fortnite. Well, and what's hard too is, is uh, whether people want to admit it or not is parents are judgy. 
So if you show up with your kid to baseball practice and they don't want to be there and they hate it and they're miserable and they're acting a fool, the kid will show it. Right. And then the parents are going, why are you dragging your yeah. kid out here to why do this? Why are you, why are you reliving your life through your kid? And you're like, you know, and, and some parents are like, that's not what I'm doing. I'm getting my kid out of the house. So he's not sitting in front of his computer screen mm -hmm. all day long. You know, this is my goal. I don't care you're about exactly right. being a baseball player. I'm just getting him out of the room because what, what I dealt with, we had, so I had Nintendo when I was a kid. I remember specifically playing with my buddies. We were playing Mario and Zelda and all that stuff. But the difference in those games then and these games now is like, you know, I tell my son all the time, if I played Mario, Super Mario Brothers on my Nintendo, and I lost, unless you had the little code, but, uh, you know, if I if you lost the three or four guys, you start all the way back at the beginning. And even with the 99 guys that you got with the special it's code. now, you got to keep going. Yes, keep you would going. die and you would get bored. You're like, okay, this sucks. You throw in your machine, you know, and then you go outside. Well, go and outside. it also was more about just beating your highest score. Right. And now like you play with your Kong, friends. Just what level can I get to? And, 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 and like you said, you start over every time. Yeah. Uh, now it's, you know, well, you're all going your on new adventures and talking to your friends. And, yeah. Yeah. I really believe. That's hurting you sports more than anything. And uh, the kids just want to be on their devices. And I don't really know. I would love, actually, I've thought about it at one point trying to put together a committee of other, whether it's board members of other associations, just people that are really uh, embedded in youth sports and trying to brainstorm to see if there's things that can we can be do to help curve this. Like I said, MYBA has been immune to that yeah. because – as other associations are shrinking, they have fewer options to. Yeah. Op I mean, there's some seasons where some of these associations they they tap out. They say we don't have enough players to play this season. Yeah. Come back next season, and so we've become immune to it because of our size. Mm -hmm. uh, if we weren't as big as we were, we would be going through some of that shrinkage. I think. Well, um, I mean, I incur I I encountered it with my son, um, and not so much with my daughter, but definitely with my son, where he, uh, you know, th that stuff it it is designed purposefully to be addictive I and mean, that's that's mm -hmm. how it's created they they're figuring out ways to get you on the and well, facebook does it to grow yeah, yes did yes. you ever watch uh what's this the the social dilemma yeah 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 I same mean, they, they're doing it to us the same thing it's the same thing so i would this was constantly a struggle and what what happens at home too and and my wife and i would disagree especially when he was younger she's she understands now and she we're on the same page with it but for a lot of his growing up years we would run into that i don't want to go today i don't want to play today i don't want to feel like doing this and she was like, he doesn't want to go. Why are you forcing him to go? I'm like, because it's not that he doesn't want to go. It's that he wants to sit up He's there and play that video He's game. Comparing. And my son did the same thing. I, you know, I had to confront him on it. Is that he got to a point in his life where everything was weighed against playing games. So yes. if I ever said, and you know, when he was small, I'd be like, hey, we're going to go to the lake, to the lake house, the family lake house for the weekend. There was no, of course, that's where I'm going to go. My cousin's going to be there. Well, now it's like everything is, you know, if I say something like, hey, we're getting together on Sunday. Well, what are we going to be doing? What's right. that? You know, because. He's gonna. Is that gonna be better? He's than not telling me, but what he's doing is he's yeah. comparing it to gaming. Right. And if what we were gonna do didn't sound more fun than gaming, he would say, "I really just want to stay home. I'm tired, and I just want to relax." And well, I game. I ran an experiment with my wife, and we did this on on purpose, where I said, "Okay, here's he." My son did something. I don't remember what it was. He got in trouble. And I'm like, "We're gonna take his PlayStation and his iPad." This was he was younger. He was probably seven, and we're gonna take it away for two weeks because of this thing that he did and and i said i promise you within two or three days whatever it is that you need him to do or you want him to do or we're going to do this he will be the most amenable uh agreeable kid that you've ever come across and it's exactly what happened because the moment that i shut that thing off and it wasn't an option anymore now it's not a choice right mm -hmm. once it wasn't a choice then if i said hey we're going to go to football practice or hey you know we're going to go i need you to help me outside in the yard or whatever the case may be well he was so bored out of his mind that he was like yeah sure whatever like i'm, I'm down Let's it wasn't do part something. of the equation anymore no it wasn't and 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 again it's not you know when we talk about this kind of stuff i think sometimes you know it gives the impression that you know we're i did the same thing like i'm not judging anything i'm just saying that yeah. this is what it is yeah it, it, it's just it's where our you know, our society has evolved to that's a part of our lives. And, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day, uh, you know, just things like our smartphones and a, can you imagine what smartphones are going to be like in 20 years? Because if you think back 20 years ago, they didn't exist. Yeah. So in the next 20, in your, like chip it, in your head. it's hard to even fathom where this stuff is going, but yeah, it's just where it, it's a reality. It's where we are. It's a reality that, People stream TV now and watch yeah. YouTube videos instead yeah. of watching CBS on Tuesday yeah. night. Yeah. You know, 
Um, it's just where we've gone, but I would hate to look back and think, you know, if we just done this, well, and I think maybe it could have helped the situation. Cause what I'm, I'm not, what I don't, I don't, you know, kids, <clears throat> I don't think that gaming and all that's the devil. No, no, no. I just, it's just so addictive yes. that it's hard for it's them to balance. Encompassing. You got to have balance and it's hard for kids, uh, the youth to, to make those decisions about balance. And then as a parent, it's hard to not give your kids what you want. Like we've talked about that if they're, you're dragging them out to practice and all yeah. the thinking about, I want to get home to, to game. It makes you look like a bad parent. Well, and that was the thing that I, it's actually, I just realized this. I want to say relatively recently within the last couple of years, but I was always a big believer when my kids were growing up, I wanted to give them choices because I wanted my, my thought process was I'm going to give you a choice to teach you how to learn how to make choices because these, some choices are bad and some choices are good. So it was kind of a thing where I would want to say, Hey, look, I'm going to give you this opportunity to make a choice. Now, more often than not, they would make the wrong choice or the, the choice that wasn't there that I wasn't wanting them to make. Yeah. And I would get frustrated because I was like, you need to make this choice. And they're like, I don't want that. I want to do this. And I'd already given them the choice. So, it, you know, it was kind of like, can't go back on it. But then as they got older and I got it better as a parent, I tell them all the time they're science experiments that we're all just figuring out how this stuff works. But as they got older, I started to give them actually less choices because I'm like, no, I got to focus more on your habits and behaviors rather than your ability to make decisions because your brain's not functioned right. yet or is not fully developed yet. So I'm not going to give you a choice. You're going to do this. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to give you, I'm going to steer you a little bit. Yes. Here. I'm going to steer you in this direction. And I would tell them like, there isn't an option here. Like this is what we're going to do, but I would tell them why I would say, you're going to do this yeah. because of this, this, and this. And there would be choices at some point, kind of like, you know, I think a lot of parents say this, like, you know, we're going to play baseball this season. And when I get to the end of the season, if you decide you don't want to play baseball anymore, then then that's your choice. But you're going to go through it first. You're not you're giving experience the, it first. Yes. We're not going to give you the choice of not doing it. We're going to give you the choice of going through the experience and then electing to not do it after that. But then what I would also add on top of that is I would tell the kids, but you're not going to do nothing. So don't think that because right. you eliminate this choice, that means you get to just sit exactly. around and do nothing all day long. Exactly. Yeah, it's tough. It's it's a different day we live in, but uh, you know the good news is there are still lots of kiddos out there that do um, you know want to play, and you know there's there's different kinds of kids that want to play. There's kids that want to play that really don't have much uh, natural ability to play yeah. sports. They're yeah. just not athletic. Yeah. But they have a lot, and that's why our, our rec league is so good. Yeah. Because <clears throat> you can there's a place for kids like that to play and still get to experience baseball. You don't have to be the best shortstop in Mansfield to get to play baseball. And but then there's a league for those that are a little more advanced. They're not necessarily the studs of the yeah. of the area. But then there's a place for the, the studs to play too. Why do you think it's there's been a thing that's developed? And I don't I don't have perspective on it. So maybe this existed before. Um, how old are you again? Old. Okay. Come on. Fifty six. Fifty. Okay. So you got ten years on me. So twelve years about. So you may have a different perspective on this or or no, but. I don't remember being a kid having parents be so wrapped up in the sports side of sports. And what I mean by that is, is um, like the best way I can explain is I tell when I was coaching my kids playing baseball and football and basketball, one of the things that I would always tell the parents is you have to remember that when you're, if you're looking at this as I'm doing this so my kid can play in high school or I'm doing this so my kid can play in college or I'm doing this, you know, for whatever that puberty is a is a game changer and when your son or daughter hits that age it doesn't matter that they've played on this select club team for the last 10 years and that this kid has never picked up a bat because when puberty sets in and that kid's hand-eye coordination and his size and his speed catch up or exceed everybody else's the fact that he didn't play baseball for 10 years and your son did is going to make no difference right. to anybody else and and so i always I feel like I think I'm sure I had my moments, but I always looked at the youth stuff. And this is why we never played until recently, really getting into the club side of things. Now, my son's in junior high. We're working to get to high school, that kind of thing. But but prior to that, we played tournaments, but it was always a little family group of parents that hung out. It wasn't mm -hmm. we weren't ultra competitive and we actually lost a few people here and there because I wasn't that way. I'm like, I'm not trying to win every tournament. I want them to learn. I want them to grow. I want them to know how to play the game, enjoy the game, think it's fun. So that way they have a passion for later on. But, and I didn't see it as much in the parents that I had, cause I was very straightforward about that stuff from the very beginning. But 
running the leagues and being involved in NYBA and being involved in these tournaments and now getting even more into the select stuff. I see so many parents that are so wrapped up in, I got to prepare myself, my kid to play at this level and play at this level, as opposed to just letting them enjoy it for a period of time. And then when it, when it becomes time to get serious, when the hormones kick in and the body is what the body is, and you see that your kid has aptitude. Great. You know? Yeah. That's probably the hardest thing for all parents is, and it's just natural is that they are never able to see their own child's performance with really clear vision. You're always gonna feel like they're better than they really are. Oh, sure. I think, I yeah, think yeah. that's just natural. Daddy goggles. There's a reason yeah, that word exists. Daddy goggles. It's yeah. it's uh but you're right, things change. I've seen literally six year old teams that are just taking it way too serious. And yeah. I've seen 14 year old teams that aren't taking it serious enough to at least get to the goals they want. Yeah. Um but yeah, it's uh, you know, I know you're just you're you're getting into the the whole club thing now too. Like I said, that serves a purpose. Like it's it's good for certain kids, but I don't believe it's the only path. Oh no, uh, I think there's lots of paths. It, it boils down more to, uh, you know, the own the, the player themselves' passion for it or desire yeah. to play. But it also boils down to the coaching that they're getting. Yeah, and repetition. Yeah. repetition and coaching is very key because you can be out there with a bad coach and play every single weekend and not get any better. Right. Uh, but you also can be with a really great coach, but if you're not getting, getting play time and you're yeah. not, you're not practicing, you're not going to get any better. Right. So, um, well, yeah, see, there's, there's different flavors for different people. We experienced it a little bit with, uh, so this was the first year that my son played school football. So I had coached him in flag and tackle all the way from the time he was in kindergarten till sixth grade. And I was more than happy by the way, to let it go like you <laughs> i'm done i retired it was great but what i experienced so like when we played this year we his football team was i mean we were terrible <laughs> it was really bad um, that was my 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 ymca crush team yes i mean Ooh, it was bad. it was rough in going to these games but it was and this is football very specific to football because um troy hadn't he hasn't really hit puberty yet he's still kind of a smaller kid and some of the other kids are starting to you know get past him in size and whatnot and it's frustrating for him but in football, he knew what to do. Like he was aware, he knows how to, you know, throw the ball. He knows how to run, run an offense. Like, cause that's how we did it. So he understands the game very, very well. His size didn't necessarily put him in a place where he was like the best player because he was a smaller kid. But if he had had size, he probably would have been. But my point is, is that all these kids came in to play junior high football and 90% of the kids that played on his team had never put on a helmet in their life. This was the first time that they were mm -hmm. playing tackle football. And I knew going into it to some extent, you know, once I figured out kind of the dynamic of it, I was like, all right, this is going to be a little tough. We're gonna have to work through this. Maybe we'll have some big kids. They'll just figure it out or whatever. But, but that didn't happen. So we would go play these teams like Burleson was a good example. We were playing in that division and they would just annihilated us. Some of it was size, but they would all have four or five kids that it, you could tell had been playing tackle football since they were like in third mm -hmm. grade and they were just lighting us up and I would be in the stands and you, you know, the dads and the parents are like, well, you know, the coaching and this and that, you know, they'd have all these complaints about what was going on. And I'm like, guys, like you have to understand football is not something that you just decide to do as a, as a 12 year old. And then all of a sudden you're good at it just because you're a good athlete, because it's a different game because you have to have aggressiveness. You have to want to go out there and hit somebody and not be scared. And it's not that they can't get there because they most certainly can and will. It's that it's not going to happen the first year that they do this because this is a whole new thing. We're sitting here telling your kids every day, be nice. You know, don't bully anybody. Be polite. Say yes, ma'am. Thank you. And don't yell. Don't get in fights. All this stuff. And then we push them out onto a football field and we're like, all right, kill, 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 kill. Yeah. And we wonder what, why, why does he not want to tackle anybody? Them? Yes. So my point is just that, you know, you have to go through experiences and you have to do stuff before you're going to become good at it. You can't just show up and automatically expect that your kids, and especially football was a great example of that. But, um, but this, this idea that, that some parents have about, well, I just got to do all these things and I'll set them up to play some kind of get a scholarship, play in college, whatever. I mean, if that happens, great, but I've always told my kids and everybody else that I've, that I've coached or worked with over the years, your kid playing high school, playing college, playing anything else has zero to do with you. It's a hundred thousand percent on them. 
They have to have the talent. That's the number one thing. Okay. You can have all the desire in the world, but if you can't throw the ball or hit the ball, then you ain't going to play. All right. And then you have to have the desire because there's a lot of kids that have really good talent and have ability, but they don't have the desire. Like the kid that burns out because he played 12 years and they never stopped. And then he gets to high school. He's like, I don't want to do this anymore. It's like a job, but you have to have those things. And we have nothing to do with that. So you have to just let it go. But it's really, really tough for parents to do that. And I understand, but I just don't know why that, I feel like that has changed from when I was playing at that age until now, or maybe there's just more of an abundance of it because the, the business side. Of are you, sports- are you saying that you feel like there's a lot of parents today that feel like, Hey, as long as I follow the recipe, the cake should yes, be great. Correct. Yes. Yeah. That it, it does. It's not just, I mean, there's different recipes that get you that cake, but yeah, if you don't, you know, the kids, the flower, I guess, in that situation. And yeah. if you don't have good flour, if you don't have the flour and the, yeah. if the, the kid doesn't have any talent, you just, you can only do so much with yeah. that, but that's know? okay. And, and and it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. And that's where I've said, like, but don't have false expectations. Right. And, and as a parent, I think we have to appreciate sports for what they are. And the reason I've always said, I liked my kids or one of my kids to play sports. I, I mean, I understood it. So that was part of it, you know, cause I participated myself and, um, and knew, knew how to play the games, but but it was more about the lessons that you get taught. You you have to learn how to cooperate with other people. You have to work hard to achieve something and practice. And you, you know, you don't always, things don't always go your way. The umpire, you might've done everything right. And the umpire made a bad call or the referee made a bad call and you lost the game. Okay. There's nothing you can do about it. So you just have to keep going forward and move forward. And I think all of those lessons are so incredibly valuable that sports teaches you. And when you focus on that stuff, as opposed to the winning all the time and being the best player on the team. And, you know, I think I've talked. Yeah. To- like, you, like you have to experience the moments and you have to experience. Yeah. It, it's, it is a lot of about the experience. You know, it's funny. It's really not related to what you're saying, but one of my favorite stories of my time at NYBA, um, I was coaching. And it was back early on when Zach was small and we were playing in the draft league. And I got a kid out of the draft that had just been bounced around from team to team to team. He was the kid that nobody ever invited back. So he'd go back in the draft and he was just bouncing around. So I got him. Um, He was not very good uh, at all. He loved baseball and he loved to play. Yeah. And he loved being there. Like he had the heart of a lion when it came to just everything you'd want in a baseball player. He just didn't have necessarily the talent. At least I didn't think he did. But anyway, he was the weakest kid on the team. He did spend a lot of his time out in right field and mm-hmm. he couldn't touch a ball to save his life. But I was determined. I'm like, I want this kid. He's such a good kid and, and tries so hard. I want him to experience victory. Right. And I don't mean the team winning. I For wanted himself. him to win. Yeah. And so I would pull him off to the side and work personally with him at practices on hitting and, and all these different things. And I'll never forget. We were, you know, back then it was like a, let's say a 10 game season. We were on like game seven. Mm -hmm. We were coming down to the end of the season. He had never, you know, been on base except for a walk. Um, It just, you know, but he he had the biggest smile on the team. Yeah. Happy to be there. I've been working with him, working with him. He gets up to bat. Everybody in the entire division knew who this kid was because he played on all the other teams. Everybody knew he was. Everybody loved him because he had heart, but he just just wasn't good. Just what nobody wanted him on his team, but they loved him. Yeah. This kid gets up to bat and he knocks the ball clear to right field fence Mm -hmm. like in it just bombs it everybody on both teams going crazy stood up was on their feet he takes off running the bases he rounds first round second as he's coming to third and i'm coaching third i'm watching the ball and the ball starting to come in so i you know i put my hands like this i'm like whoa whoa whoa, stay right here right here here. i don't want to name his name but stay right here stay right here here." and he with the biggest grin he could he rounded third and keep going Went home, got thrown out. Oh, no. And I'm like, oh, but everybody was going nuts. Yeah. It was the greatest feeling in the moment. He lived with his grandparents. Uh-huh. His grandparents immediately came over the dugout. You know, of course, I was close by because of third base uh, coaching. And they were like, um, he came in and, you know, they were telling, they were, you know, congratulating, whatever. And they came over to the fence and he said, oh, my gosh, that was the greatest moment of his life. That's just so amazing. Thank you for all. And I said, I just, I said, I wish he would have stopped at third. He would have been, and, and they go, well, you know, he can't hear, right? <laughs> I'm like, what? What? They go, yeah, he can't hear. <laughs> I've had like no idea. 12 practices with this kid at least. Oh, we were in God. our seventh game and I didn't know he couldn't hear. 
He could read lips. Yes. Wow. And he couldn't leave. He couldn't read my lips round and third. That's amazing. And uh, even though I was doing this, he didn't get it. But <laughs> that's my greatest. Uh, it's one of my greatest moments. I've had some really great moments that that just feel awesome. But I love that moment that he got that hit. But I'll never forget that I'm like, you didn't think you should tell me that? And they said, well, he wears hearing aids to school. Yeah. And people pick on him. All this. And so baseball is his moment. Yeah. He refuses to wear them to baseball because he wants to be just like all the other baseball players. And See, I, I, it broke my heart. But at the same time, I'm like, well, now I can better coach him. Yeah. I can make sure that he's – because who knows how many things I had said to the team and he couldn't even see my face. Yeah. He had no idea. You know, it's – it's, but it's, see, it's that kind of stuff and, and those kind of moments that make you – want to continue doing what you're yeah. doing and i know now so you're um you actually uh, i want to talk real quick before we wrap up here i want to talk about your business a little bit so um speaking of your passion for kids and you know everything that you like to do so so now you are uh running a, a company that helps schools and organizations do fundraising so tell us right a little bit so about that. you know we've we've said everything we've said about the myba and and i don't make a dime on that I, I lose money basically uh being the president but i made my living in the restaurant business and i did that forever and and the time came that uh i was no longer with the same company i'd been with forever and i thought you know if i'm ever going to start my own business now's the time right while i'm not working for any but not don't have a job basically yeah, yeah. um and so i thought it'd really be great if i could find something that gave me the same kind of uh, fulfillment that I get out of running baseball, but I can make a living at it, right. you know, because I am passionate about baseball. I feel like youth, I feel like it's been my calling to try and make sure that the kids in this area get the best youth baseball experience that they can have. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm passionate about that. And, and I'm, I've always been passionate about kids. Anyway, long story short, I, I got involved with this uh, existing company that does fundraising with schools where I have these incredible, just they're really special people that work for me. They're, mm -hmm. they're amazing people that are very charismatic and everyone just loves to be around them. And the kids just love them. And they go into schools for two weeks at a time. Uh, and they basically, they do, they go in there and do a character program where they're talking to kids about basically being good humans. And man, my, Mike and Kevin look different, but they're still the same. We're all the same. Uh, we may come from different backgrounds, but we all have the same opportunities that, you know, we teach these, or they teach these kids to dream big. They can be anything in the world they want to be. And that when they dream big and accomplish those goals, they inspire others. It's all this great messaging, but all, all on the while it's a fundraiser for the school. And uh, they put on a big event at the end. That's typically like a fun run or an obstacle course or something like that. And so instead of the students being out, you know, selling $12 candles or seeing how many candle bar candy bars they can peddle, right. um, they get friends and family to sponsor them in the event day. Okay. And so maybe for every lap they run, grandma gives them a dollar or whatever. And so grandma feels a whole lot better about giving a dollar per lap and that student going to do their best than just, hey, you know, Buying a candy what do I hate the least out of this catalog yes. or whatever? Right. And so it's just a really great thing. And, you know, it's uh it's been very rewarding because what my people do in the skill in the schools is, is phenomenal. Like the testimonials I get from teachers and principals and parents, and it's just incredible mm -hmm. the difference that they're making. And, you know, we just finished the fall semester and uh, it's something I'll communicate with them before we start up spring, but they, they have, they, they have an, have had an impact on over 10,000 kids lives just in the fall semester yeah. alone. And so it's really great. You know, you, you know, I'm serving schools. We're doing schools all across DFW and uh, it's just, it's, it's a really special program. Most of my schools will tell me, you know, the two weeks that apex is here every year. Cause we, once we get a school, we 90, about 90, 95% of the time we you keep hold on them. to. Yeah. And uh, year after year, they just talk about what a great program it is, that that's the most exciting two weeks of the year. Attendance is up because the kids don't want to miss seeing the team members. Right. It's just a really great uh, two weeks. And, you know, you, you don't, I'm not going to get rich off of serving a, a, a school here, but if I can put right. enough of them together, I can make yeah. a living at it. Yeah. And uh, I really feel like we're making a difference. And it's funny because the easiest schools for my people to serve are not necessarily the schools that need us the most. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of the fundraising companies like to chase the big wealthy schools. Mm -hmm. That's where all the money is. 
But yet what we do, it's really, I mean, all students benefit. We, we serve schools all across the Metroplex from all different walks of life and tons of money in some and no money in others. But a lot of the kids that uh, really need the program are the hardest for my people to serve because the kids are more unruly. They're not getting good guidance at home and things right. like that. And they're the schools that nobody wants to send their kids to and things like that. But that's where we really can make a huge impact because those students, those kids just don't want to, uh, you know, disappoint my team members. They right. think so highly of them. And it really is a great two weeks. It's a, it's a really good, uh, feel good two weeks. Most, I would say majority of my, or a lot of my principals and a lot of the teachers friend me on Facebook after the school gets going. Yeah. I've made a lot of good relationships that way. Uh, I've learned a, a lot about the school system that I didn't know before, which, you know, is for another podcast at another time. But there's one thing I'll say is, although there are, just like anything, there's a handful of people that probably have no business being in education. There's sure. a lot of people out there in education that really give their heart and soul to it. And they're underappreciated. They're destroyed by parents. You know, you can have, it's just like baseball. Yeah, You can have a class full, a classroom of 20 kids, but it just takes one parent to make your life miserable. And uh, the schools deal with that on the regular. And the more time goes, the less the schools can do about it. And, right. you know, everybody, you know, as soon as they pull a student out of a classroom for disrupting the rest of the class, it's lawsuits being threatened that that student's not getting the education to the other students. And it's just, yeah. it's tough. It's really tough. And I really feel for uh, a lot of my educator friends now, but they, most all of them, their hearts are in the right place and they, they work hard and they are not doing it for the paycheck. Although they, they deserve uh, more than they're getting that, you know, cause if you think about it, you know, our kids spent 12, if they went to college, even more years being developed by people we don't even know. I and think, a lot of times they're just paid nothing. I think it's the greatest travesty of yeah, anything paid nothing because almost. if you think about your kids time spent their life in, in their adolescent years, right? Younger and adolescent years that they are the vast majority eight weeks. So they spend 40 to 50 hours a week with some other human being that's not you being raised by them, right? So they're away from you more often mm -hmm. than they're with you because they, they're sleeping, they're doing whatever. So they're with mom and dad for five or four or five hours a night while they're awake. That's it. Yeah. Every they're they're with this other person exactly. all the time. And you know, we we talk about wanting to be the when we are one of the best countries on the planet, et cetera. But but we have to invest in people. Like if you want to be the best, if you want to run a can you imagine company, for a minute, let's say for a minute that being a first grade teacher paid two hundred thousand dollars a year. And I'm not saying that's the answer, but if they made yeah. two hundred thousand dollars a year, yes, you'd have a whole lot more people trying to get that job. That the schools could be way more selective about yes. who gets those jobs. You would get the best of the best. But yes. instead of the way we treat teachers now, we get the ones that are just willing to do it. Right. Yeah, that, and not that necessarily the best. Yes. Well, and sometimes they have to, or that's where they end up. Like it's the <laughs> I joke. I don't want to give Chili's a hard time, but I joke about Chili's that I use Chili's as an example all the that time. that people end up at Chili's. You don't. Nobody goes to Chili's. Nobody's like, hey, let's go to Chili's tonight. Like nobody says that. But people say, where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? And it's like it's the happy. Let's neutral. Get it's the neutral. Let's go to you Chili's. Know what you're going to get. Right. And I think that that's what people kids do or young young adults do in college and stuff. It's like, what do you want to be? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'll just, I'm going to be a teacher. You know, it, it's fine. I can go do that or whatever. Not, see, not, I, not everybody. I I'm just saying. But see, I think times have changed, especially since COVID during, you know, because I was there with them, too. You know, we were serving schools virtually, some yeah. of them. But when COVID happened, the teachers jobs changed dramatically where now they had to deal with all these regulations of students that were in person. Yeah. They had to deal with students that weren't even on the campus. Yeah. They had to, and then they had this hybrid situation. It was really tough. But even then I felt like the teachers weathered that storm really well. But now like this year for my business, the a number one profession that was applying for the jobs that I was hiring for with my team members were teachers. teachers. Yeah. Three times more than ever before. Yeah. They're trying to get out because they're stressed. Yep. The job has changed. Well, they don't pay well enough. Yeah. It used to just be that, well, yeah, you don't make a lot of money at it, but I really want to do this. The passion now for it's, it. I'm not going to make a lot of money at it. And the job's going to be so difficult. I'm yeah. going to have parents are going to treat me like crud. Yeah. Um, it's not at all schools. It's not all situations, but it, it, it is in a lot of them out there where I, my thing is just teachers are very undervalued 
and very underappreciated. And we would be way better off if we put more value yeah. on what teachers do and compensate them accordingly. Yes, I I a hundred percent agree. And it's it's one of those things. Like I joke all the time with my wife that you know because I love and I'm sure you know you love to coach. I love to coach. I love being with the kids and working with them and doing all that kind of stuff. And and I would say like I I I would love to quit my job today and go coach you know whatever I could and and teach and what I would that would be great. But I can't can't, can't walk it, away from what I'm doing. No, I can't yeah. make enough money to make it worthwhile right. to me to do that. And, and I feel terrible for, you know, those teachers out there that just love what they're doing and they put so much time and effort into it and so much passion. They're so underappreciated. I know, you know, people say, Oh, well, I, you know, we send them the gifts for Christmas and we, you know, we send them the, the mug for their birthday or whatever, you know, they're the little things that people do and parents do. And if you're in a good community, that stuff happens. But, um, but the amount of time and effort and, and stress of dealing with, I mean, we, we get around our of, kids, a handful of $10 gift cards to Chili's no. does not make up for the fact no. that they're, they're making about half what they're worth. Yes. And it just and, doesn't make up. And it. we, as parents, you know, after two hours around my kids, I'm like, Ugh, I'm done with you. Like go away. <laughs> I don't want to deal with you anymore. And, and we put these, you know, kids with our, with these teachers eight hours out of the day and just take for granted the fact that they're dealing with all the stuff that we hate dealing with for two hours when they're home with us. And then we hold them to really high expectations. Yes. You know, we're only going to pay them this, but man, they better perform like they've got doctorate degrees. Yeah. And, and, yeah, gosh, no, it's, it's it's a tough time to be a teacher. Tough. It's a tough time to be a police officer. Yes. It's a tough time to be a lot of things. But you know, it's a good time to be involved in youth baseball. So, how much longer do you think you're going to do this? That's a great question. Um, my answer has changed over the years because people ask me that. I remember after five years, like, how much longer are you going to do this? We've been doing yeah. five years here in year fifteen. For a long time, my answer was, I don't know. Yeah, like it's. I feel like it's my calling, and I feel like. You know, I'm called. That's my give back to the community. Yeah, is to try to to make sure that the kids have a good experience at baseball, all the kids. Um, but I do feel like now I'm starting to see the end. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how far. I can't tell how far away it is. Um, I feel like there's still a note at the bottom that says object may be closer than they appear. Right. It may be sooner than I think. Yeah. Like I said, uh, I don't know if I said it on here or not, but there are a good group of commissioners we have now yeah. with some real talent that I think are going to be able to step up and take on some new leadership roles. And um, I just really want to make sure like, yes, it does take up my time right now, but I, uh, the juice is worth the squeeze. I enjoy yeah. the time. I, you know, anytime I'm ever in fact, the way I think, like I said, it just takes one parent. I have that one parent that gets in my ear and just tries to do their best to try to make me miserable. All I got to do is go out to the park and watch a ball game yeah. just just walk through the park and then immediately i'm reminded, realize all the people I'm, i, I yeah. want to keep doing it forever yeah i'm like this is the magic this is why i do it yeah. and i just want to do it forever but you know i would say as soon as i i mean at some point or another it's gonna it would have to happen i guess uh i told you before that you know i could see myself really doing enjoy doing this in retirement yeah but like i'm still several well, years away from yeah. retiring so am i just gonna uh, you know my plan is to help groom some of these younger, uh, newer uh, commissioners and maybe some coaches that we have into taking on these leadership roles and see if I can't step back. Um, it's not that I feel like if I step back, it's going to collapse. It's just that, you know, a well, lot of people like, like you still want to do it. Even like yourself. I do. Yeah. I, I want to, but I know that I need to let somebody else, you know, because honestly, when I came along, I know I brought a lot of new ideas and, and I was me and a lot of other people, yourself included, were able to contribute and make MYBA better, the, the association would benefit from that. That's one of the reasons why I want to get some new board members on board, whether I'm here or not, right. just to bring in new, new, ideas, new, set, new, of, new, set, of, new set of goggles, yeah. look at things differently. Um, but I don't know. I do. It'll be really hard for me to walk away from it. Like there's a part of me that says I did my tour of duty. I did 15 years. I mean, like how much, yeah. how much blood you got to give. Yeah. Um, but then there's another part of me that says, but why, you know, what's so bad about, why don't, why wouldn't you just keep going? Yeah. Uh, if somebody ever came along that really wanted my position and I felt like was really qualified and would do a yeah. good job, I'd step aside in a minute. Yeah. Or if the, the general population, the coaches said, Hey, look, it's time for a change. We need to, but that's not what happens. I have people tell me on the regular, I hope, you know, don't leave anytime soon. Yeah. I hope, you know, yeah. this is so much better than our experience was down the road. I hope you're not going anywhere till my kid is out of, you know, is out of, is in high school. Yeah. And so I get those kind of notes all the time that keep me going. 
but I don't know. Well, it's tough because people. <laughs> it's funny you say that. People get spoiled with things, and what I mean by that is, is if you grew up playing NYBA or your kids did, they started like mine did, started at three and then played all the way till you know sixth grade or whatever, or even high school or junior high. Um, you 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 kind of take for granted how well it runs and how good everything goes, and you know there's always hiccups. Nothing's perfect. There's always exactly. things that go sideways, but for the most part, but those people and you know maybe myself included you, you lose sight of what you have until you go participate in another organization and i got that perspective because of football and basketball and other things but if you don't do those things and you just play baseball it's like the parents that just play baseball those are kind of the ones that have been there for a long time that you run into problems with but the ones that come over from other organizations and other places and they play with you they're like this is this is great. Like, <laughs> well, see, that's part of what fuels me to keep going is because people do tell me that they yeah. come from other associations. Like, this experience is so different. Yes. And I don't want Mansfield to lose that. I don't want NYBA to lose that. And I know that it's not happening just because of Kevin, but I know that as long as I'm here, I'm going to make sure that's happening. And so I don't know if the next group of people will keep those those things sacred that are so important to making sure the experience is is because because things like you know that were happening when when I first got here where you know coaches were selecting their some of their own players out of the draft that's like that stuff can't go on I remember when I first got here and somebody said something about the good old boy club mm -hmm. and boy I defended that to then I'm like it was literally my first thing I'm like there is no good old boy club here no. you know I wouldn't be a part of a new boat but they were right there was a good old boy club you know when you're a lot, when we say we have a random draft, yet some coaches are being allowed to say, hey, make sure I get these two. That's the good old boy club. That's yeah. by definition what the good old boy club is. Some people are getting away with things that other people's aren't taking care of your buddies or whatever. And so and I don't think anybody had ill intentions at all. It just seemed like it. Well, that's just how it's done. You know, they they, they helped us rake a field one day. Let's let them pick a player, you know, whatever that people yeah. justify stuff like that. I'm not saying there were bad people running the association or had ill will. I think. Sometimes you just don't re you only know what you know, and sometimes you just don't realize that hey, this this what we're doing here really lacks integrity because yeah. it seems right to us, but because nobody's calling us out on it, we don't realize it's not. I noticed that Paula and Brett, whoever this is, yeah, Brett works with me. Yes, Brett, uh, thanks for the comment. You're right. You know, I don't know if he mentions maybe making somehow incorporating VR into the experience of baseball could be uh, part of a solution, but yeah, I mean, I don't know something like that. Maybe, maybe virtual practices is a thing yeah. that could be. Yeah, could be. Um, but I think we need to think outside the box because at at the nuts and bolts of it, we are still getting out there and practicing and playing the game the same way we did back in the 70s. Yeah. It's the same game. Same thing. We might change the rules a little bit, but it's the same game. And he's right. You know, if kids, you know, when I was a kid, no, there was no such thing as aluminum, aluminum bats. There was only wooden bats. Yeah. So at some point we had to start allowing aluminum bats and he's right. You know, we need, that's, that's my whole point is what if, what are we not evolving into that we should while still, uh, you know, protecting the integrity of the game. Yeah. Uh, if, if this is just the way life is now and everything's well, digital and electronic golf's done that. Yeah. Golf. You're a great example. Yeah. Well, they, they great went example. from, uh, well, and I don't know how prevalent it is now, but like you see a lot of those whole golf courses, turning into like the soccer thing with the big ring around it where they're kicking the ball, but then also, you know, the top, top golf, golf and yes, and playing nine holes as opposed to eight. And you can practice, you can yes. practice your golf swing virtually. Yeah, absolutely. And so he's right. That's a great point. Honestly, it's something I really hadn't thought of, but it, it that it's that kind of thing though, that I'm interested in having discussions about with some other people that yeah. are, you know, embedded in youth baseball because and honestly, it's all youth sports. I think I don't think it's just baseball needs to be thinking about this. I think softball does, and basketball, and everybody. Every, we're all you, and it's not. We're not competing with it from a business standpoint. I meant, I mean, from the, for the best of the kids, the, you know, human that humans yes. being humans yeah. and enjoying this great game that we love, whether it's ba basketball or baseball. How do we evolve with time so that people keep wanting, wanting. to play? Yeah. That that's part of your childhood yep. and. I, if something doesn't give, I don't think it's going to be the only baseball kids ever going to play is against, you know, uh, Hank Aaron on the, on, on the TV, MLB the show, yeah, MLB yep. the show. Yep. So yeah, it's uh one, one quick thing. And I, I want to wrap up, but I do want to ask you because we've talked about this before and I want to know, I personally want to know the state of it. But one of the things that we've always said about NYBA is that I think that we could do, or you guys could do even more if you wanted to, to some extent, if we had the fields 
to do so. And there's a misconception to some extent of the people that play in the league about how how much control MYBA has over the fields and what you can actually do. Exactly. And then, you know, we go to places like playing in these club stuff now. We go to Texas Star and we go to all these and we're so centrally located to the south, you know, the south east part of Tarrant County and Midlothian and Burleson and Joshua and all these teams that go play in McKinney. I'm if I have to go play in McKinney one more time for a baseball tournament, I'm going to lose my mind. Cause it's- yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because in my opinion, like I've already stated, we, we are one of the largest, if not the largest youth baseball association in Texas, one of the largest in America. I wholeheartedly believe that Mansfield could be the youth baseball hub of, of North Texas. If I not agree. Texas easily. Yes. I mean, we have, in my opinion, one hand tied behind our back and we're still, Yes. One of the largest. And it's not because we're the largest city. No, nope. It's not because of all these other things. It's because we have a great offering here. We have people here that care about youth baseball and often, and people have shown us they want to come play here. Not only do people come play here, but they end up moving here, which the city doesn't want to recognize. They spend their dollars here yet. Um, the fields over time, instead of improving have, have, for one of the biggest organizations in Texas, and the I'll fields say have you, deteriorated. Yeah, we I'm played to, some of the worst. I'm trying fields. to put this in the right in the right way, but literally, I've said this in meetings with the city. The fields that we play on now look identical, except they look identical to the ones I played on when I was a kid in Burleson. Yep, at the old uh, Bartlett Park. Yep. Uh, and when I got here 15 years ago, they looked better than they do now. Yep. When when I got here 15 years ago, we had a nice uh, flower bed right there at the entrance groom looked really nice. It wasn't anything fancy. It wasn't a brick. It wasn't a brick entry with ironwork or anything. It was an, that as they let it, as as it deteriorated and got worse and worse, I finally brought it up to city and say, look, this used to look really good. Can we spruce this up? Whatever. Well, instead of doing that, they leveled it and putting rocks in. Yeah. It's a rock bed now. Um, But we have big league dreams. Yeah, well, yeah, oh gosh, don't get maybe we should talk about that to <laughs> yeah. be honest with you because honestly, that's a little bit of point of a contention right now. Uh, I will say that when we took that big spike and jumped to about 2,100, 2,200 kids, I was really scared. We were, we didn't have enough fields. Yeah. It was tough. Yeah. It was really tough to run the league with not enough fields. That's when we were forced to figure something out with Big League Dreams. When I got here, we did not use Big League Dreams for a variety of reasons. What I was told when I got here or had heard everybody was telling me, and I don't mean necessarily board members, but parents. Yeah. We don't want to play Big League Dreams because they charge us to get in. Yep. There's beer being served out there, which, to be honest with you, you know, you go to Chuck E. Cheese, there was beer, but for some reason, or at the Ranger game. There's still beer. They didn't want it to be able to. Yeah. 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 So, um, all they these reasons why they don't want beer to. Now. But the problem is, <laughs> We we experienced a big spike in, in in participation, and we needed to do something because yeah. we already had moved to starting the season earlier than anybody else starts their season. We were playing later than anybody else started their season. There was nowhere else to go, and so mm-hmm. I finally arranged a meeting with Big League Dreams Corporate. They came from California because they wouldn't work with them before that. They wouldn't. They're like, if you want to play here, you're going to pay this and pay the you know pay the use the fields, going to have and all this. So I got them together and I said, look, and up until this point. What I was told, and I'm pretty confident this is the truth, Big League Dreams had lost money. The company had lost money on this location every single year it had been open. They were in the red every single year. And so I sat down with them, and I said, look, the most expensive seat you have in this place is the empty one. Right. Because they're not buying hot dogs. They're not buying pizza. They're not buying whatever. They're not paying to get in. The empty one is the most expensive one you have. So let's work on that. I need field space, or we need field space, sorry. And you need people in these seats. So I negotiated with them to get the gate fee down uh, to a lower uh, gate fee for our parents. That was more reasonable. And I negotiated that anyone 13 and under didn't have to pay and no, no players ever had to pay. And that the two coaches. coaches, two coaches could get in free yep. and that worked for us. It wasn't ideal. And Oh, and if we, you know, it be BLDs in pod, they have two pods. There's four fields over here, four fields over there. They call them a pod. And each one has a concession stand. The agreement was that if we were playing on this pod, the beer taps were turned off over here. Right. And if we're playing on both of them, they're turned off in both places. And they did that for a long time. And honestly, I don't have a whole lot of complaints about BLD, except that they recently sold. I do wish that the city had put, um, made youth baseball, not necessarily 
MYBA is youth baseball here, but they should have made the youth baseball experience a bigger part of the plans for BLD. A bigger because priority. Everybody paid for that, approved that, thinking that's where our kids are going to go play baseball. But honestly, it was built BLD, the company, their target uh, their target participants a beer drinking softball player. Yeah. That's where they make their money. Yep. Those guys come out there and buy pitchers of beer at a time. They pay good money to play there. That's who they wanted in there. They didn't even want us there. Yeah. So we started playing on, you know, the weeknights and we made those negotiations and it worked out well. And I'll never forget, I'm not taking full credit for it or, or MYBH take full credit, but it is what it is. I'll never forget at the end of our first season of using that park in the newspaper everywhere in Mansfield, it said BLD finally turns a profit. Right. So I'm sure it was a combination of things, sure, but sure, that was sure. part of it. Well, now there's new owners in there and without calling a meeting with us at all, without discussing it. And by the way, Forrest, uh, if you're watching this, the manager of BLD, high respect for Forrest. He he d- works with us and does a great job. This has nothing to do with the manager right. or the staff at BLD. This is BLD corporate. The new owners decided to pretty much double uh, the gate fees on us overnight and all these other rule changes. And basically for me to put – a family of fours, just half their games out there, six games out of a season or five games. It was going to cost that family over a hundred dollars in gate fees just to go watch their kid play. Yeah. They were going to pay more at the, in the gate fee, forget buying a hot dog or a $7 Coke or whatever. They were going to pay more to go watch the game than they were paying us for registration fee to get a uniform and all these other things, yeah. umpire fees. And it's just not, it just doesn't make sense. And I realize they're a business and they got to do what's best for their business. And I don't, I don't know what it, their financials look like after they did that. And we stopped playing there. I mean, I, I had parents, I, they didn't even tell me they raised the gate fee. The reason I found out is the night they did it, I started getting all these texts from BLD from parents. They're going, this is ridiculous. Yeah. We do not want to play here anymore. If this is the way it's going to be. Yep. And so I talked to Forrest and as much as I didn't want to do it, because, you know, I know that, uh, Forrest, the manager of theirs, you know, he has performance that he's gauged on and a lot of its numbers and things like that. But I, I just couldn't in good car. We couldn't in good conscience tell this family, you, you're going to, you're going to go play over there. and It's going to cost you a lot of money. Yeah. And so we tried it the first season, not doing it. It's not easy. It's not what we prefer to do, but all of our games are back at the sports complex. But to your point that you made, so BLD, if you're watching this, we, we should talk. Uh, well, we, here- we don't have to have your fields, but mm-hmm. I, I wish the city, like I said, I wish the city made it, more of a priority that that youth baseball was part of the experience part of the youth baseball experiences is playing over there and it's really not in the in the lease agreements with them at least i don't know what it is with the new owners but at least in the prior owners they were supposed to give us certain amount of usage of the fields if we asked and you know like girls softball played there one season and they never went back right for a reason and we kept doing it because we needed the fields and in that time 15 years ago immediately we started having meetings with the city saying we we need to do this to our fields. We, we I never once went to them and said, let's scrape and build. Right. Let, we need a whole new park. I never did that. But I'm like, we need to start working on improvements. And right away it was like, oh, there's a master plan and there's all these things. And over time, because there's always a master plan going on, we don't want to spend a dime today if we're spending, you know, two dollars and ten, you know, and they'd always say it's a few years away. Yeah. Why spend those dimes now? So nothing ever got done. And so over time, the trees and the shrubs went away and the posts out front of the park are all rusted and unpainted and all these things. The only thing really positive that's happened in that park as far as improvement and improvement is they built us a storage building. That's too small, but they built us a new storage building by field one. And that's it. Yeah. Same, you know, same restrooms that were being used when there was only four fields there and there's nine now. Yep. Same little tiny concession area that is smaller than your, this little space we're in right now. Yep. Um, It's just ridiculous and we can't get anywhere with it. And yes, they did, you know, you could say, well, they put it up for bond and the, the, the voters spoke, well, we're in a recession. There's a lot of other things going on. Tax, uh, you know, appraisals had just come out. There's a lot of reasons why it may not have passed, but at the same time, it doesn't take a bond package, just budget some money in the last 15 years. We could have transformed this park into something amazing. If they just spent a little little money, money a little money each year, instead, now it's so far behind you know, you talk about Burleson or Grapevine and some of those other cities that built nice parks. Those parks not only are so much nicer than ours, but they're like, they've been around for a while yeah. now. Even and they're starting to get a little outdated. We still have the same fields yes. that yes. don't look as good as they did 15 years ago. And so that I just don't really understand. There's, there's times where I feel like, you know what? 
MYBA is not just one of the largest baseball associations in Texas, one of the largest associations in Mansfield. Like what other group has that many members in it? Or, you know, there might be, a, there might be some, there's not many. There's times where I think, you know, we just got to make our voices heard and we got to go. And then, in fact, we got called. We were we were actually going to go to City Hall one time, and we got asked to stand down. Basically. Well, I, I wanted you. The reason I wanted to ask you about it, and I'm sorry we had to wait to the last year to do it, but no, you're fine. But the reason I wanted to ask you is because I think you personally and NYBA gets a lot of grief about the fields. Like it's has something to do with what you're not willing to do or unable yeah. to do, or the cities, or or they don't understand how how much because I witnessed it myself because I've been to the Parks and Rec meetings and. W- you guys fight for this every single year. Like, it's, it, it's, it's an ongoing it's battle. It's every single year you're fighting for. We just can't win. You know, I will say there's a lot of good people in the parks department that that work very hard for us. And I'm going to give a special shout out to Heath. Heath's the most incredible employee that they have, to be honest with you. But, um, it, you know, they all have jobs to do too. But, um, like I said, there's some good people there. But then there's some people that, honestly, I feel like could care less. They, they, they'll just give you lip service or whatever it takes to get you to go away. And, um, it's a shame. I mean, man's, we want, we say that we're, we, we talk about ourselves, the city of Mansfield in such a positive way. And there's so many positive things that happen with the city. Yet there's things like this that we just neglect. And, you know, there's very few young, by the way, girls are invited to play with us if they want. They, they usually choose yeah. to play girls softball. So Girls want to play. They can play there. I'm, when I say the word boy, it's just mostly it is boys. But you, you'll be hard-pressed to find a single boy that lives in Mansfield that doesn't at some point play MYBA. Mm-hmm. Everybody at least tries it. Some Very point, few yeah. don't at least try it. Yeah, Lots of them play it. Uh, you'll be hard-pressed to ever find kids on any of the high school teams that didn't at some point play MYBA. Yeah. Very rarely does it happen. Yet we've just ignored that park. And we do every every season, every year, we do minimum maintenance. Whatever it takes to just put lipstick on. We don't even put lipstick on the pig. I'm not even going to say that because we don't even – they don't even do that. We we groom the fields just enough. We repair the mounds just enough to get through another season. Yeah. That's all that gets done. Yeah. The When the restrooms get terrible enough, they'll repaint them. Yeah. But they're the same stalls that were in there 15 years ago. It's the same flooring, same mirrors, all that. And I just don't get it. I, I, we we build these nice parks. We build nice infrastructure and buildings. And attr- we want to attract all these nice businesses and all these things. Yet so many kids go through that park. And so many, you know, on any given Saturday, we'll have, um, gosh, 20, I, I do the math on it occasionally, 2,500 spectators that go through that park on a Saturday and who leave and go it. spend their money in this town, yep. but we won't spend any money on that park. Yep. I just, we need, for instance, we need fenced in uh, warm-up areas. Yeah, The kids have to warm up, throw the ball where people are walking. Yes, And it's just ridiculous. And, you know, the city, so if somebody for the city was sit, were sitting here right now, they would say, oh, we have plans right now to try to address that. But there's been plans to address right. that for 15 years. Right. Yes. And there was a master plan for years and I was told, oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And then I remember we got just to the point where it was some stuff should have started happening. It's like, well, we've decided the master plan is so old, we need a new one. Right. And everything went out the door. We, if, In fact, at one point, we need more restrooms at that park so bad. We were willing to foot the bill on the on a good chunk of putting some new restrooms out there. Yes, I remember that. Remember? Yes. I fought hard for that. We fought hard for that. And we were going to put up the uh, half of the money, most to do of it. the money, yes, most of the money. Yes. And they sent it out for bid, came back. Somebody on the council at the time, it wasn't current council, but council at the time, somebody didn't like it, send it out for rebid again, get some more bids. The process took so long that by the time they got the bids that they the extra bids they wanted to get, the price had doubled because lumber was going up right. and, it caught, and then they scrapped it. We can't pay this much money for something like that. So guess what? We still have the bathrooms we had 15 years ago. Yeah. We have nothing more. Yes. And so on Saturday, you'll see either lines of kids and or people lined up out the bathroom door to use the bathroom, or they're standing out back peeing on the trees. And there's no, there are no attendants or people from the city that are there to clean the bathrooms and take care of it. That's all the volunteers that are well, there. Well, I don't want to, I don't well, want to knock them too much on that because I think they. I'm not going to complain about that, that you're okay. in their eyes. We do lease the park from them. Okay. They leave it to us in good shape. So I, I don't want to knock them too much on that. Um, Cause the people that are in charge of that, I think, you know, we can pick up the phone we can say, Hey, we need this. And they do, they do a pretty good job with that. But as a city, we just treat 
most of our youth sports really bad. We yeah. just, you know, we, we just ignore them. And it's such a Which big is odd part. for a place with six high schools that, yeah, you know, and, and sports is so important in high school sports. And, and, and we, I just don't, I, I really don't understand it. And it's funny because I'll never forget one council member. Uh, the very first season we started using big league dreams, his first night out at big league dreams, he was a newer council member at the time. I won't name him by name, but he went out there and he could not believe we had just spent all this money to build this park and now he had to pay to get in there. And he sent out an email <laughs> to me and every council member, uh -huh. the mayor, everybody, and said, this is ridiculous. Uh, this it's, it's not an appropriate amount. We shouldn't even have to pay to get in there, blah, blah, fired it off. And I remember thinking, wow, at least, you know, at least somebody at least is advocating for us. And he got shut down quick. Yeah. Well, the now, only I wasn't time privy to the conversations that were had with him, but that whole issue went away. It was never spoken about again. The only time things change is when people demand it. And that's really what it boils yeah, down to. Yeah, that's what to. I say. The squeaky wheel gets the oil. And there's times where I feel like it shouldn't come to that. And that's why we haven't done anything like that. But we did have a night where we were going to go uh, make a statement at a council meeting. And, and we had a ton of people that were coming to try to get more fields. And I was politely asked not to do it before it happened yeah, and told that we will have some meetings and we will get it addressed. And they assured me that the solution was coming and it was all part of that first master plan. And how'd that work out? Did not happen. <laughs> and so then it's like, huh? but then you also get bigger fish to fry. It's like, do I really want to be spend the, uh, the time it would take to advocate championing and really cause champion that. getting, cause I do that. That's like, honestly, that's been one of my goals on my plate is like, I really want to stay long enough to see these kids get a better park to play in. Yeah. Whether that's a new one, because that's, that seems to be the city's best interest so far has always been to build a new one, get rid of the old one, build a new one, um, which if they can do that, that's fine. But it's like, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Right. And that's what it's been all yeah. or nothing. And it's said, it's, since it couldn't be all, it was nothing. Yeah. And I've really wanted to see the day uh, that, these kids got a park that, could, that we could all be proud of that when you walk in and, and we're working on another plan now since the, the bond package didn't pass. And, right. you know, I want to believe in it, but I've heard this so many times before. It's hard to believe it, but we're working on, or they're working on a plan to maybe put some, you know, some brick and mortar and, and wrought iron at the front and uh, putting in some warm up areas, things like that. But I mean, until we actually put something at that park and actually do something, it's getting really hard to bite him. It's almost like, you know, they just keep crying wolf. You mm -hmm. know, it's like you keep mm -hmm. promising things to us. And I'll even communicate that to our members. You know, this is, this is what's where we're headed and what it's going to look like in the next two or three years. And in 15 years happens. later, it's yeah. worse. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I want to say, you know, I appreciate I mean, we're at almost two hours here, so we went a long time, but I really appreciate you coming in and talking to me. And I, I do think that, you know, the time and effort that you've committed to the city and, and doing what you're doing. I don't think um, I, I hear more grief that you get than, than positive. I know you hear a lot of positive stuff and, and I think that that's awesome because there are the vast majority of people are thrilled and love how everything works. But um, yeah, like I said, it's, you know, with roughly 3000 parents in a season, it's usually just five or six that express yeah. discontent, but man, they, they really try hard to make your life miserable yeah. and you just have to try to move past those because making 2,995 people happy is pretty, pretty darn good. And I learned that a long time. You'll yeah. never make everybody happy, no matter what yeah. we could stand out at the ballpark and tell everybody to come out tonight because we're handing out free money and somebody would complain that it wasn't enough. Right. That we didn't give them enough notice. <laughs> you just can't make everybody happy. But I think we do a pretty good job of, doing the right thing uh, as, as often as we can. That's in the best interest for all the kids. And uh, you know, when people do uh, you know, send something nice, I, I don't need anybody to tell me, thank you. I don't need, but when you get some positive feedback about how we're, wow, this, I just got here. This is so much better than any experience I've had before. Or you hear, wow, this was our great, my son had the best season ever. And you know, People have to realize coaches volunteer too. Yeah. I don't go out and interview coaches and right. we don't decide, oh, well, let's right. handpick the coach. You know, it's whoever volunteers. A lot of times you're calling, like you got called the very first time to say, hey, we don't have a coach. Can you help us yeah, out? Yeah, that happens. That happens. Yes. We have to recruit coaches. Yeah. And sometimes we have to tell coaches, look, this isn't for you and you don't need a coach anymore. That's yeah. happened a few times. But um, I'm really proud 
overall of what you know you were a big part of where we are today and there's a lot of people in the past the lesters the tonys the the joshes and even the guys that were here when i got here um they they had an impact on making myba what it is today and i think we've done a pretty good job of evolving over the years and continuing to uh be open to change but i do think we need to think about next level and uh what baseball looks like for the next 10 years and how we slow down this gravi gravitation over to electronics or maybe incorporating electronics like uh brett has said but yeah i, I appreciate being here i, I could talk I th i've said before when this is all over when i do leave myba or step down uh, i need to write a book yeah because there's so many things that oh, yeah. i'm not saying yeah um not necessarily to bad about people just about experiences of what, what comes through. with running an association like this yeah and just the nature of some people and uh like i said the schools i could do the same thing with schools when when the, i wouldn't do it now um because i wouldn't want anybody's feelings to get hurt but um like i said our, our our school system needs some attention um they're not the teachers don't get the love and the administration don't get the love that they need to but yeah i could i could talk all day about some of these things but i appreciate you having me yeah it's been, no, been a lot of great. fun i uh we'll do it again sometime we get we, there's there's tough like i said we could talk for hours and hours about this and and uh you know down the road we'll we'll hook up again my hope is is that uh you know maybe we can get some headway on some fields and you know really make an improvement for the city and get people you know fired up about that a little bit you know it's just uh because i do think i mean my kids are old they're older they're they're not going to be participating in that and i ain't having any more kids so yeah, my son doesn't participate anymore but i'm just really passionate about yes. just the experience the kids get yeah. here yes you know because you know it it can be a good experience and it can be a bad experience and it's not always going to be great you can't just sign up for myba or anywhere and it's going to be a perfect season because yeah. there are volunteer coaches and there are volunteer people we can't control all of that uh sometimes we can react but we can't necessarily control things from not happening mm -hmm. i think overall i know we're trying to wrap this up but i think overall our parents because i think we lay a good groundwork but overall our parents are well behaved yeah you know you oh, see all great. The, you yeah. see these videos online and yeah people fighting on the fields and things like and i'm not saying that things don't ever get out people don't ever get out of line but for the most part it's very minimal and it's very controlled and yeah. i think part of it is us laying the groundwork and and being serious about hey if you are coming in here acting that way we're going to eliminate you you won't be here at our park but we also just have really good people here yes. that really care about a great baseball experience and and you were one of them well i think you've done a great job and i hope you continue to do the job because uh i think it means a lot to the city and and i do think there's a lot of room for improvement and i think that you could uh you know continue to be the advocate for that and make a difference yep. with it and and i look forward to it so we'll definitely do this again sometime but again yeah, i have a i don't know if you know or not i have a youtube channel and we've thought about starting some podcasts so i'll have you as a yes guest on. i want to mind them no no i love it i love it i love talking about this stuff it's one of my favorite topics so um if anybody watched this all the way to the end i appreciate it if you see it down the road thanks for hanging out and tuning in for a little while uh and we'll get back to you know real estate and finance another day but uh this is something i really enjoy and um, i really appreciate you being here kevin absolutely so, thanks for doing this all right we'll see you guys later